So just with just as with before, we're still concerned principally with uh, these two variables, the total value output from the two departments each period. So we've got this y1, and that's just like the total amount of value of all of the things the department one makes. And we've got y2, which is like the total value of everything the department two makes. And we're going to have these things changing each period. Now, in the case of simple reproduction, which we just looked at, they are not changing each period. They're just the same numbers each period. And so, you know, that's, that's the whole point. But now these things are going to be changing. People are going to be reinvesting. They're going to be probably increasing. And as they increase, this that gives us a little bit of a problem because we still want to kind of break it down into the three kind of C, V, and S parts. We still want to be able to do that. But um, a little bit of ambiguity arises in the case when Y1 and Y2 are changing, specifically because like, what if like I don't know that Y1 changed, but let's say that C1 changes. Why did C1 change? It could have changed for one of two reasons. It could be that C1 changed because technology changed, and that like changed the C over V ratio, and so the C, C, this one got bigger and this one got smaller or something like that. Or it could have changed because I, I reinvested and, and this changed. So it's a little ambiguous. And so basically what we want or we want is, is we want a better way to kind of break down, break things down into a CV and S. We need to kind of come up with a little bit of a more sophisticated way to think about breaking down these total value outputs uh, than just kind of writing it out and saying that it exists. So here's how the how's how here's how to make sense of this. Um, we're, this is going to be a little bit of review, kind of, but it's also probably good to do a little bit of review at this point. So let's let's say we're talking about the car industry. So for a specific make and model of car, there's a specific bundle of raw materials that's needed to make the car. We know this, uh, which is the same for all car manufacturers, right? And and we're assuming like that that it's it's this it really is the same for all all people making this specific model of car, uh, you know. So because that that was one of our big assumptions is that we have standard production techniques uh, for making everything. There is a specific way that everybody goes about making a specific kind of commodity, and so there's a specific bundle of raw materials which is is associated with a unit of that commodity. Likewise, there's a total amount of labor time, which must be exerted to, on those raw materials in order to produce the finished product, right? If, if there's a standard production technique, then I know that it should take five hours of like people's labor to assemble the raw materials together into the thing. And, and if it takes longer than that, then I'm being inefficient. So suppose a car has like a value of 300 hours. I don't, I don't care if this is accurate or not. So say so we have some specific car, its value is 300. And let's say that of this 300 hours, 200 hours is spent making the raw materials. So 200 hours of that value is the value of the raw material specifically. And then 100 is spent assembling those into a car. And so we have this proportion two to one, which applies to the car industry generally, uh, the whole thing. And if I give you an hour of output value from the car industry, not a car, I'm not giving you a car anymore. Now I'm giving you, I'm just handing you like some value. I'm saying, here's an hour of value. I can always say that like 66% of that, two thirds of the value is value of raw materials. And that one third of that value is value that's, that's labor added on. Th th this, unif th this condition of kind of breaking things down in this two to one way applies no matter how much value I output from the car industry. And so we have these kinds of numbers that are associated with the car industry, two thirds and one third. And so if I give you like, you know, 600 hours of, of, of value from the car industry or 605 uh, hours of value, if I give you any amount of value from the car industry, I can multiply that by two thirds to get the value of the raw materials of that value. And I can multiply it by one third to get the value of the, of the labor added on. And so th these two numbers, two thirds and one thirds are essentially like numbers that characterize the car industry at the moment. It, 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 they're, they're, they're constants of technology, they'll change if the technological composition of the car industry changes, if technology changes, then these change, but they don't change when the actual amount of value changes. And that's kind of exactly what we were after. So for any industry at all, it doesn't matter if the car, you know, so for any industry at all, there are two numbers, C and L, which characterize that industry technologically. And they have to satisfy the identity that one is equal to C plus L. So if I give you one hour from the car industry, that breaks down into two thirds that is value of raw materials and one third that is value of the labor. So that's fine and well and good for an individual industry. But what we're interested in is aggregating a whole department together from a bunch of industries. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. Define C1, little c1, this is a lowercase, to be the average of all of the C's from department one 
and we're gonna let L1 be the average of all of the L's from department one. So we're just gonna take the so we're just gonna take the C1 associated with the whole department, the whole capital goods department, to be the average of all of these C's that are kind of more concretely defined for each industry. I hope that makes sense. Um, and, and this is what Marx does too. Um, we're gonna let C2 be the average of all the C's from department two, and L2 be the average of all the L's from department two. And it's noteworthy that they still add up to one. These these averaged versions of the C's and the L's, they still average to one, and here's kind of my proof of that. If this confuses you, don't worry about it. The, the, the sum, the, this, this big Greek letter sigma here means sum. Basically what I'm saying is that if I, if I take C1 and L1 and I add them together, then that's equal to the average of the C's plus the average of the L's. The average of the C's being I add all the C's up, and then I divide by the number of industries that I have. So I'm assuming here, I, don't, I guess I don't write it, that I have n different industries. So I'm adding together all of the C's, dividing by the number of industries I have, that's n, doing the same thing for L, and then I can combine those two things in the numerator because they have the same denominator, and so I get the sum of all the C plus L's, but, but C plus L is one in every case. And so I'm just adding one n times, and so what I really have here is n over n, which is one. And so I still have this identity that if I take the C and I add the L, I get one. It's, it's true in the average case as well. So they, they, you know, so in the averages, they add up to one, just like the, just like the, they do for the industries. So I kind of have these de departmental versions of these numbers. And I should probably add a small disclaimer at this point that when, by working with these C's and L's, by working with these average kind of C's and L's, um, we are sort of, uh, working with, we're going to be working with an, a macro system that is only kind of approximately related to the micro system. So, um, the, the degree to which that step is legitimate really depends on how close industries are to each other within, depart within the department in terms of composition of capital. The more similar the productivities are of industries within the same department, uh, the more accurate this becomes. And, it, and, the, and the, the degree of approximation disappears entirely if all of the industries in department one have the same composition of capital, all the industries in department two have the same composition of capital. But nonetheless, I think even if there's a high variance of compositions of capital within each department, I still think that uh, that doesn't really affect the qualitative results that we're going to obtain in the macro model. In fact, I think that it bodes even worse for capitalism as a whole. And you can decide for yourself when we get to the results uh, how much you how much you think that you agree with that conclusion of mine. I, I still think that this is actually getting a phenomena that you will see in reality. Um, I, I think that that will only kind of I think that it's very limited the degree to which that approximation affects the qualitative results that we're going to find here. So, okay, we're, so we're basically going to start over now. Um, I'm gonna define Y1 and Y2 exactly how I did before. And except I'm putting this kind of parentheses T here. And if you're really new to math, what this means is that Y1 is a function of T. Essentially the idea is that I plug a T into it and I get a number out because we're gonna be having kind of time elapse. And as time elapses, uh, the values are going to change over time. So Y1 of T is going to denote the total value output from department one at the beginning of production period T. So at the I'm at some production period. I've gone on. I've, I've gone on for like, you know, some you know five production periods. Then t equals five at that point. And and y one of five is the, is the is the total value of all of the things that Department One has put out uh, as commodities in the beginning of that period. And a production period can be as much time as you want it to be. It could be a year. It could be five years. It doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, I'm I'm probably going to default to thinking about it as a year. And Y2 is the exact same thing, uh, but for department two. So for the, cons for the, for the consumer goods industry. Um, and so what we just finished talking about is that I have a C1 and a C2 and an L1 and an L2. I have these kind of numbers. So that given an hour of value output from department one, C1 of that hour is value of the raw materials. And then L1 of that hour is value of labor used to process those raw materials. So the number one kind of breaks down to a C1 plus an L1. So if one breaks down to C1 plus L1, then if I'm given, you know, if, if, if I'm given one hour and that breaks down into C1 plus L1, then if I'm given Y1 of T hours, then that's going to break down into what? That's going to break down into, you know, it's the same thing. I'm just, it, you know, Y1 of T is just so many ones. So Y1 of T is going to break down in the exact same way to C1 Y1 of T uh, plus L1 Y1 of T. You know, you can kind of see this more algebraically by saying Y1 of T is equal to, well, if C plus, if C1 plus L1 is just one, then I can multiply by it. 
and then when I distribute, I get back to there. So what I have is the identity generally that I can take y1 of t and I can break it down into c1 y of t, y1 of t, and this is the value of the raw materials of, of that total value output, and l1 y1 of t is the total amount of labor that was done to produce that value that period. And that's important because L1 here, so, so this number here, L1, Y1 of T, this is specifically the labor that was done during the first, dur during the teeth production period. You know, this value existed before the production period we're talking about. Um, and this value is the value that's actually done during the production period, during the previous production period. So that, that's kind of why this is important to think about. Um, and the same is true of Y2, obviously, as well. Y2 of T is equal to C2, Y2 of T, plus L2, Y2 of T. So next, we're going to break down the L's into V's and S's. So the way, the way to kind of do that, and the, some of this is review, I understand, but it's, it's, it, we're going to build a model here, so it's kind of important that people are very clear. So given L1 hours of labor are done in Department 1, what we know is that some amount of that was paid for by a capitalist and the rest was given over to them for free because that's just the way that capitalism works. And so just as uh, one breaks down into a C and an L, we have that L breaks down into a V and an S, right? The V is the amount that's paid for uh, and the S is the amount that's not paid for. So this is the paid part of L and this is the unpaid part of L. And then similarly, you know, L2 breaks into a V2 and an S2. Now these are not necessarily the same. Uh, the V and the S's are not the same in, in the two departments. However, what we are going to assume is that we have a uniform rate of exploitation across the whole society. In other words, the rate of exploitation is a societally defined thing. It's not specific to either department. So the, we'll assume uh, rate of exploitation Uh, is the same for all society. If I'm a capitalist and I live in this society and I buy an hour of labor, I get the exact same amount of labor for free uh, as any other capitalist you know, investing. It doesn't matter who, which capitalist I am. If I go into the market and I purchase an hour of labor, I get the exact same amount of unpaid labor as any other capitalist. So it's the same for all industries, i.e., and so what that means in math is that you know I'm gonna call the rate of exploitation E and it's S1 over, over V1, you know, E is, e is S over V. Um, and, uh, but, but, the, but basically what I'm gonna say is that the ratio of S over V is the same for both industries. So if I take the ratio of the S, so these S's and V's aren't necessarily the same. This V2 is not the same as this V1. This S2 is not the same as this S1. But if I take the rate of exploitation by dividing the S by the V, I'm going to get the same ratio either way. And that ratio is the rate of exploitation. Um, so that's just worth noting right now. And uh, so if L1 is equal to, I'm putting arrows to you know kind of indicate that it breaks down into V1 and S1. But I could, I, I would really what I want to say is equality. Um, and so in that case, what I finally have is that I can go back up here, and I have that Y1 is T is equal to C1 Y1 of T plus L1 Y1 of T. But if L1 is equal to V1 plus S1. can just replace it with that. And so what I get is C1 Y1 of T plus V1 Y1 of T plus S1 uh, Y1 of T. And so now I've defined my C's and V's and S's. So, and so to con kind of uh, uh, conclude what I just said, I now have exactly what I was after, which is a more sophisticated breakdown of the total output value from the two departments into a C part and a V part and an S part. I have these numbers now, these kind of global kind of technological kind of coefficients uh, that uh, are associated with the, the departments. I've got the C1 and a V1 and an S1 and a C2 and a V2 and an S2. And in both cases, they add up to one and they allow me to basically break down uh, an amount of value in, in the department into the, the, the appropriate kinds of things. Now, before I move on, I want to note something kind of important, which is that 
of the total output from society, um, some of this existed in the previous period. Not all of this value output is labor done in that period. Specifically, C1, Y1 of T plus C2, Y2 of T. This is value of raw materials. I get, so if I hand you like the total amount of value of all the commodities put out by the two departments, the, the parts of that that are raw materials, that's value that was produced before the previous production period. It's, it's value that was available before. It's the raw materials that were used, so it had to be made before. So this had to be in the previous period. It had to be produced in the previous production period. So I want to draw this kind of out in a couple of ways. So in, it, what we've been talking about a lot is like the timeline of the working day. So I've been drawing these bars, right? I'm going to draw a really long one because I'm going to actually like draw two days. So like basically, uh, we'll, we'll put the day right here. So this is like day one or, or uh, you know, we're kind of not thinking about days anymore. We're really thinking about like production periods. But I, I want to look at this as basically like, I want to th think about like the previous period and the current period. So that's what I'll call these. I'll say that, you know, this represents the previous period. I'll call this that like T minus one because our current period is T. Um, all the way, you know, that would bring us to period T plus one. So uh, So basically, the idea is, you know, we have two timelines. The, the thing we've been writing is that, you know, in order to produce the next day, each day, everybody has to basically spend some amount of time making the raw materials for tomorrow, and then some amount of time making the things that they'll need to eat and drink and sleep and stuff tomorrow, and then some amount of time just kind of given over as, like, tribute to the capitalist class, right? That's, that's the timeline of the working day as we've been talking about it. Um, but it's important to note that, um, you know, when I'm talking about the total value output, um, I'm not talking about this C, V, and S uh, because I'm talking about an amount of value. I'm talking about a, comp a set of commodities, and I'm basically trying to think about, like, what's the value of those commodities? Not all of the value of those commodities is labor done that day. Some of it was done in the previous period, and that is this amount right here. So if I'm looking at the current period, I have a C part, and I have a V part, and I have an S part. But this C, V, and S is not, uh, is not like as simple as, well, here, here let me show you what it is. Um, this C part here, this is the raw materials that were made for the current production period. And so that is exactly what I wrote right here. This is uh, C1, Y1 of T plus C2, Y2 of T. These were the raw materials that were available before the current production period. Um, so that is the C from before. So this, the big C that I've, I was writing when I write out these timelines, that's this now. That's what this is. So if that's what this is, then, then what are these? What's, what's, what else is going on up here? Well, in order to understand that, I think what we need to do is rewrite it in the original way we had it. This is C1, Y1 of T plus L1, Y1 of T. I can write it that way if I want to as well. And this is C2, Y2 of T plus L2 y2 of t. This is the, these two guys, this is the labor that is done during that production period. So this is the labor done during the actual production period. And basically the way that it breaks down is that L1, Y1 of t this is, what is it? This is the amount of time that is going into making raw materials. It's the living labor used to make the raw materials, the dead labor for tomorrow. And so basically what, it, what we have is that this chunk here of the current period, this is L1, Y1 of T. And then this, the rest of this region here, this is L2, Y2 of T. So all of this is, you know, labor done during that day. It's all living labor for that day, except some of that labor is spent making the raw materials, and that amount is L1, Y1 of T, and the rest of it is L2, Y2 of T. So, I mean, I think that's important, you know, conceptually, because we've been writing C, V, and S a lot, and so what we have now is you can understand now how the current C, V, and S is relating to the, the Cs, Vs, and Ss that we've been writing. It's not as simple as you'd think. It's a little confusing, actually. I hope that 
people can understand this better than I could at first, because I had some trouble piecing together my own kind of conceptual apparatus for thinking about this stuff. But that's, that's what's going on. This C part, the current production period, that is the living labor done to make the raw materials that day. That's L1, Y1 of T. So um, that's important on its own right, just kind of conceptually. But it's also important to note on its own that this amount had to exist beforehand. That's going to be really important because remember, one of the main goals of ours is to think about what is actually materially necessary to do the kind of growth that capitalists want. And we have one of the requirements right here for later. So that's going to be an important thing to just have. So now we're going to get kind of started really thinking about an example. We're going to kind of go through like a derivation of the equations that I think Marx wanted to write down, but maybe didn't quite get around to maybe figuring out how to write down in the way that he wanted to. Um, we're going to come up with some concrete numbers. So basically what I'm going to say is that like suppose that C, uh, assume for our capitalist society that uh, the rate of exploitation is just one. We're just going to make it very simple. We're going to have a rate of exploitation that's equal to one. Uh, and then we're also specifically going to have like uh, uh, C1 equals one third v1 equals one third and then since exploitation equals one and exploitation is s1 over v1 it's actually at that point necessary uh, that s1 also equal one or one third excuse me because again another reason to think about it is that they all have to add up to one so i'm just going to have an industry one uh, uh c1 is equal to one third v1 is equal to one third s1 is equal to one third um, and then likewise i'm going to i'm going to have that c2 is equal to two thirds I'm going to have C2 be a little more capital intensive. If C2 is equal to two thirds, and uh, basically the rest of it has to be equal parts of V1 and S1, then you know two thirds is actually four sixths, and so one sixth has to be V1, and uh, one sixth has to be S1, because they have to be the same. Because S1 and V1, because the ratio of e, uh, S1 to V1 has to be uh, one. And so what I've given you here is six, I guess, seven numbers, really six, because if I give you these six, it kind of makes this necessarily one. I've given you some numbers that basically characterize a capitalist economy. And there's some other numbers to maybe infer as well uh, that are important because we've, we've got some other categories besides just the rate of exploitation and these C's and V's and S's. For example, we have compositions of capital. Um, this also implies uh, compositions of capital you might be called this the technical composition of capital although it's kind of wrong to call it that um, uh, c1 over v1 that would be the composition of capital for the in the the first department right and so that's one third over one third which is equal to one and then we've also got c2 over v2 and, and by the way the, you know the notation we would call this k1 and then K2, that's the sec composition of capital for department two. That's C2 over V2. That's equal to two thirds over one sixth. And so that's, a, you know, if you flip the six over, or I mean, you can basically write this as four sixths and then the six is cancel. And so at that point, what we have is, uh, I'll just say it like this is four sixths over one sixth. And so this can the six is cancel and I get four. So K1 is one, K2 is four. So in other words, we have a society, oops, we have a society which is, for whatever reason, uh, has some disparity between uh, the wage wage and luxury goods industries, the consumer goods industries, They're, they just tend to be more productive uh, than the capital goods industries. Is that reality? I really don't know. Uh, it could be the opposite. Um, the one thing I will never assume is that they're equal. I'm going to assume that they're always at least a little bit different. Um, so what this K2 being four be means, by the way, is that when a capitalist from department two goes and, and, and takes some money to market in, in preparation to uh, uh, you know, be a capitalist, they're going to end up spending four times as much on raw materials than they do on labor power. That's what this four means. Likewise, if a capitalist from department one goes to take some money to market to invest, they're gonna spend the exact same amount on raw materials that they do on labor power. That's what this means. So we're coming up with numbers that sort of characterize how our capitalist society works. 
And there's one more thing that we need to assume in order to really think about all of this. We're going to assume something about the behavior of the capitalist class, and this is exactly what we said we were going to be mainly doing. What we're interested is in is a society in which the capitalists are on the whole all basically reinvesting a fixed proportion of their surplus value each period. And so that's the last number we need to define. So basically, we're going to say that each one of them uh, always reinvests A equals one half. They're going to all reinvest one half of their surplus value each period. And they consume the other half. So what we need initially are some initial conditions. We need to decide on uh, what y1 and y2 are going to be initially uh, in order to kind of go from there. So suppose initially that y1 of 0 is equal to 100 and y2 of 0 is also equal to 100. In other words, uh, the, the initial amount of value that we have from the two departments is just 100, 100 hours or whatever, whatever units we're measuring time in, in both cases. So t equals 0, by the way, is like uh, the beginning of time. It's like the beginning of our system. You know, you have to define a beginning somewhere, and so we're just defining it to be t equals 0. That's the beginning of the first production period that we care about. So what we want to think about with these two numbers is we want to think about what these numbers are going to turn into when the capitalists reinvest the surplus parts of it. Uh, so we have 100 output value from the two departments, in, uh, and, and, and the capitalist class wants to reinvest as a whole half of it in, in order to expand production, and then we'll get more value output uh, in the next period. The question that we want uh, we want to figure out is how do the, how can they do this or or uh, you know in other words what do these numbers turn into when that happens what is y one of one right what is, when I plug in one what do I get when I plug in one what do I get here um, and we're going to start out by naively assuming something in order to kind of uh, get a sense of the problem um, to start let's just assume that capitalists are just reinvesting entirely in their own industries or at least at least they want to do it and I think that's reasonable in the sense that capitalists are lazy. And so, you know, why would I invest in some other industry? I'd rather just invest in the same, in the thing that's comfortable to me, right? Just reinvest in my own industry. That's that's that would be the simplest way to expand, right? Why would I why would I get into some other industry if I don't have to? So let's start with that kind of assumption, and think about what these numbers would turn into if that happened. If if capitalists are exclusively reinvesting in their own industries, then then it's only the surplus from this department that goes into this department, and it's only the surplus from the second department that goes into the second department. What I mean by that is, what are the surpluses? So we have 100, so of uh, the 100 uh, output value, uh, S1 times 100 of it is surplus. And specifically what that is, S1, if you remember, we defined it to be a third. And so uh, that is to say uh, one third times 100, which is third. I'm going to say, I'm not going to write equals. I'm going to say approximately, uh, approximately 34. So 34, uh, uh, you know, we have 100 output value and, and um, one third of that is surplus, right? And, and so 34 of that is the surplus. And so if capitalists are reinvesting half, then uh, capitalists. Uh, want then to reinvest uh, one half of 34, which is equal to 17, uh, back into production. So this is the amount that they're going to want to reinvest. Then if, if all of the capitalists in Department 1 decide to reinvest uh, this percentage of their surplus back into Department 1, industries within Department 1, then on the whole, we have a situation in which the capitalist class as a whole in Department 1 wants to reinvest this much surplus value back into production. We take the surplus part of the 100, and then we take half of that, because which is what we said we were going to reinvest. So in symbols, this is actually uh, A. Remember, A is the reinvestment rate. A is equal to 1 half. And then also S1 is, is how much of the 100 we're taking. And so basically what this number here, the 17 is, uh, is it's uh, A times S1 times Y1 of 0. 
So that's actually, you know, in, in symbols, that's, that's where the 17 comes from. You take S1, you multiply by Y1, and then you multiply that by A. And let's focus entirely on department one for a while. We could figure out, you know, you know the surplus, there's a, there's a different amount of surplus from, from here, but we'll, let's not worry about that. Let's just worry about department one for now. So the capitalists are going to take this 17 hours of output value uh, in, in surplus, and they're going to reinvest it back in production. So what happens next is that this, uh, this 17 that's being reinvested, you're going to take it to market and you're going to use it to buy more raw materials and more labor power. And the split between the raw materials and the labor power is going to split the 17 up again. It's going to be split according to the composition of capital between raw materials and labor power. So uh, the, the composition of capital in our case for department one is one. And so since K1 is equal to one, that means that the capitalist is going to spend uh, as much on raw materials as they do on labor power when they bring the 17 into market. So in other words, uh, this 17 is going to split into 8.5, uh, half of the 17 in raw materials. And it's going to split into 8.5 in labor power. And the reason that we have to kind of consider this split is that the raw materials aren't going to generate surplus, but the labor power does generate surplus. I buy labor. But then because I bought labor and I get more labor for free due to exploitation, I'm going to generate some surplus and that's going to add on to the total value output at, at the end of the next period. And so since E equals one, that means that for any hour of labor that I buy, I get, it, I get an hour for free. That means that the 8.5 hours that were reinvested in labor power are going to generate 8.5 surplus. And so uh, since E equals one, we get 8.5 hours of surplus. And so that's the generated surplus. So we take the 17 and we reinvest it back into production. And so that's going to give us the old number, 100, plus 17, and then plus the new surplus, we got 8.5. So y1 of 1, that is to say that you know the total value output from department 1 at the end of the next period, after we do this reinvestment, is going to be equal to the old y1 uh, plus the amount reinvested plus the new surplus generated by that reinvestment. So that, that's what we have here. Um, and so really what we have is 100 plus the 17, which I am going to write separately. I'm going to write, you know, this is the 8.5 that's been invested in raw materials. And then there's another 8.5 that's invested in labor power. And then there's an 8.5 generated in surplus. And so if you put those together, you get 125. And so this is, uh, these two guys are the reinvestment. Now, what I want to show you next is how to get these 8.5s out from the 17 if you have a less simple composition of capital, right? Like suppose this seven, suppose K, you know, K, K2 is equal to four, you know, uh, what that means is that I'm going to spend four times as much as raw material on raw materials as I would on labor. Uh, if I was reinvesting 17 hours, how would, how, how would I split it? You know, given this K, K2, it's, it's a little, uh, it's, it's, it's not super simple, but it's actually, it's pretty simple. Um, so in symbols, you know, I'm starting with 17 and that's equal to a times S one times Y one of zero. And then the, basically to get these two 8.5s given C and the V, what you do is you write this as equal to C1 plus V1 over C1 plus V1 times what you had before, right? So I'm just kind of adding in one here. So this is just, this is, this really is just one. So I could just kind of insert it here and just pretend it was there. And the use of that is I can now split up the fraction. I can split this into C1 over C1 plus V1 times A times S1 times Y1 of zero plus V1 over C1 plus V1 times A times S1 times Y1 of zero. So I can basically split it up. And if you stare at these, what you see is that this actually is, this number here, this is the 8.5 in, in constant capital, and this right here is the 8.5 in variable capital. This is the new constant and this is the variable. So that's how to do it in general. If you're given the C and the V, and you're also given the amount that you're gonna reinvest, then you can split it up this way by just multiplying by one and then splitting up the fraction like this. And so the next thing I want to say is like, how does the surplus get generated? We said, you know, exploitation is one, so that generates double the surplus. But like in general, how that works is you just take this part, 
this variable part and you multiply it by e. So surplus generated is e times uh, the accumulated variable capital. which is going to be equal to e times v1 over c1 plus v1 times a times s1 times y1 of 0. I know that's a lot to look at, but something magical is going to happen if you kind of keep going down this path. So just kind of bear with me for a second. So this e here, you can rewrite it as v1 over, or sorry, s1 over v1, because that's what e is. We, we mentioned that, that this ratio of surplus to variable is the same for both departments, and it's, it's, it's e. And so if you rewrite E as S1 over V1, then this V1 cancels with this V1. And so what I end up with is something that's maybe a little more clear, which is S1 over C1 plus V1 times A times S1 times Y1 of 0. So now in symbols, uh, Y1 of 1, we had before that it's equal to 100 plus uh, 17, or, or sorry, plus 8.5, plus 8.5, plus 8.5. The idea here is I can now rewrite this in symbols and say that this is equal to y1 of 0, that's the 100, uh, plus c1 over c1 plus v1 times a times s1 times y1 of 0, uh, plus uh, v1 over c1 plus v1 times a times s1 times y1 of 0, and then that's, that's this 8.5 here, and then finally plus S1 over C1 plus V1 times A times S1 times Y1 of 0. So I know that's a lot to look at, but if you really look at it closely now, you see something magical is about to happen, because remember, uh, C1 plus V1 plus S1 is equal to 1. And I have a common denominator for all three of these guys. So if I, I can actually combine them all together and say that this is C1 plus V1 plus S1 over C1 plus V1 times the, the whole thing here, and then I just get 1. So this is equal to y1 of 0 plus c1 plus v1 plus s1 over c1 plus v1 times a times s1 times y1 of 0. And so this whole thing is just 1. And so what I have here now is almost kind of what I want. I'm going to do, I'm going to mi mix the symbols up a little bit. I'm going to move this a in the front and I'm going to put this s1 right here where this uh, 1 was. So this is going to give me y1 of 0 plus a times s1 over c1 plus v1 times uh, y1 of 0. And then the last, and then I'm almost done. I'm now going to factor out this y1 of 0 from both terms here. And so that gives me 1 plus a times s1 over c1 plus v1 times y1 of 0. And so this is, this is looking a lot more clean now. But there's even one more step that's kind of amazing, which is right here. Look, what's this thing? This is S1 over C1 plus V1. What's that? That's pi 1. That's the rate of profit for the first department in value. And so this is, and so what we finally have is, is the formula. So Y1 of 1 at the end of the next period is going to be 1 plus the rate of reinvestment A times pi 1 uh, times the old times what you had at the, be end, at the, at the, at the beginning of the period. You're just scaling up by a percentage, which is given by the rate of profit uh, times the rate of reinvestment. So if the rate of profit is like one fifth, and uh, then and I'm reinvesting half of that, then it's as if the rate of profit was half the rate of, half of one fifth, right? So I get a hundred, I get a hundred percent plus some other percent, some extra, and so what I get is this. And and what's nice about doing this symbolically is I can kind of I have I have all of them now. I can kind of do this again, you know. Then if I want y one of two, what is that? You know, that's going to equal one plus a times pi one times y one of one, which is one one plus a times pi one times y one, which is this. So I can kind of plug this in, and I get uh, one plus a times pi one again times y one of zero. And so that's actually equal to one plus a times pi one squared times y one of zero. And so it's just the same thing, but I have a two here now. And I really had a one here before, right? Because it's, it's a one here. So in general, have uh, that y1 of t for a general t, that's just always equal to one plus a times pi one uh, to the t uh, times y1 of zero. 
This is a general formula that will give me, if I start with y1 of 0, and I'm reinvesting a, uh, uh, a equals 1 half in this case, if I'm reinvesting a percent of the, um, uh, of the surplus each period, then the way that the, y, that, the, that the output from the department 1 grows over time is exponentially in this way. I'm just taking this much percentage of it. I'm taking like 105% of the, old, of the old thing just repeatedly over and over again. So I can just plug in a t here and get anything I want. And so the exact same derivation applies to department two. Um, uh, similarly, for department two, have that y two of t is equal to one plus a times pi two of t times uh, y two of zero. And so if I plug the numbers in, uh, what is pi two? Pi two is um, so pi 2 here is going to be s2 over c2 plus v2, which is 1 6th over 2 thirds plus 1 6th. So just to kind of put this over here, pi 2 is equal to 1 6th over 2 thirds plus 1 6th. 2 thirds is really 4 6th. And so what I really have is 5 6th down here. And so I have 1 6 over 5 6. And so the 6 is cancel, and I just get 1 5th. What I have down here is 1 plus 1 half times one-fifth uh, uh, to the t times uh, y2 of 0. And so uh, what I really have here, this is like one-tenth, and then this is ten-tenths, so I really have eleven-tenths to the t times y2 of 0. In other words, what this amounts to is basically, I'm con uh, you know, the way that the department 2's value output grows, if I'm just constantly reinvesting half of the surplus, is that I get 110% uh, every single period. So I get 110% of what I had before every single period. That's what this means. You know, and so if I started with 100, then y2 of 1 is equal to uh, 11 tenths to the first times 100, which is equal to 110. So what we have is that if the capitalists were to reinvest this way and they started with 100 each, then department 1 would go from 100 to 125. And department 2 would go from 100 to 110. We also have general formulas for the growth rates. We have, we, have, we have the growth curves. We have that y1 as a function of t, just in general, if I want to know what it's going to be after, on the teeth period, if you kind of work out what, you know, the, what pi 1 is here and, and, and put this together the same way we did for y2, what you get is 5 fourths uh, to the t times 100. And then y2 of t is equal to 11 tenths to the t times 100. And so these, these are curves that, you know, I can, I can plot this with respect to t. I can kind of think about, uh, you know, t on this axis, and I can think about like uh, y1 and y2 of t on the other axis. And what I would see is something like this, basically, right, uh, where you're just kind of growing in that way. And in fact, you don't have to imagine what these look like. In fact, you can uh, see for yourself. So if you, look in the, if you look in the description of this video, there's going to be a link to a Desmos app that I made that's going to help us visualize all of this. So let's go ahead and jump over there. So if you click the Desmos app, you should see uh, exactly what I'm looking at here. Um, uh, uh, these two curves are the curves we derived. Um, you can see for yourself that they're the same. So basically what you're looking at here are these are the growth rates of the two departments. This is department one. The, the purple line, and then department two is the red line. And you can see they both start at 100, just like we said, and then uh, they, they grow kind of an, an exponentially because you're just multiply, you're just taking a percentage each time. And you can see, you know, sure enough, by the time we get to one, uh, we're looking at 125 in department one. And if you get to uh, one over here, you see 110. So these are the growth paths that we just derived. These are the ideal, I, I, I labeled them I. These are I1 and I2 kind of to kind of symbolize uh, the I stands for ideal. Um, and just to kind of say a little bit about um, this complicated Desmos app, which I'm going to be gradually explaining as I go through the next few videos here, there's a lot to see. Um, basically, what you have here is a programmable capitalist economy. So if you scroll up and bring up this, uh, click this uh, initial condition slider tab, like click the arrow to bring it up if it's not up already. Uh, these two, these two guys here are the initial values of, of the initial values from the two departments. Y two I for Y Y one initial and y, y2i for, for y2 initial. I have them both set equal to 100 because that's what we said we had. 
And then if you ignore everything else for now and scroll down to global parameter sliders and open that up, here you can set uh, you can set up everything that we everything else, right? You can set the rate of exploitation. Expo rate of exploitation is one, just like we said. You can set the rate of reinvestment. That's 0.5, just like we said. You could set and you can also set the compositions of capital one and four. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but if you set these four parameters, then you've also set the C and the V and the S because uh, the C and the V and the S, uh, you know, those are functions of K1 and K2 because K1 is equal to C1 over V1. So if you say that K1 has to be something and you say that E has to be something, then that actually forces uh, all of the other variables to be something. You can kind of see that for yourself uh, by clicking and opening up this technical parameters uh, tab. You can see that C1 is indeed a third, V1 is a third, S1 is a third, and you can see I've defined them in terms of K1 and E and K2. Uh, you know, all the way down. You just get the things that we, we said already. So specifying the compositions of capital of the two departments and the rate of exploitation of society is enough to kind of fully kind of capture the whole capitalist society and how, what, how it's going to behave. And you can slide them around. You can move K1 around and you can see as I move K around, I get different curves. Uh, as I change the rate of investment, I also get different curves. If I change the rate of exploitation, I also get different curves. So you can, you can mess around and you can, you can just see what these curves look like, but they don't look that interesting. They kind of just look like nice balanced exponential growth forever and that's because this is ideal we haven't considered whether or not the growth that i've been describing is actually possible so let's consider that next so the question we want to ask now is can they actually do this this growth that they want you know this is like the, the default lazy growth and in, in that i just i just reinvest blindly in my own department and i just stay in my lane uh, in order for this growth to happen two things need to be true uh, really three things um, one is that you need sufficient raw materials produced in the previous period, right? In order to expand, I need to have the materials available to do the expansion. I need to have make sure that the raw materials are available in the market to go buy with my money that I'm saving. Uh, and additionally, uh, you need sufficient consumer goods to bring in the new workers. If I'm hiring, if my, if my economy is getting bigger, and this is crucial, we're going to have to say a lot more about this. If my economy is growing, then that means that I am bringing more workers into the economy than were there before. I'm hiring new workers. In other words, we're assuming kind of by default that there exists a kind of latent population of workers that can be hired, like that, that are just available. And I'm going to assume that's not an issue. I can assume, I'm going to assume the capitalist class can always do that. Uh, and that's a big conversation to have, why that can be assumed. Uh, but we're going to hold off on it. Let's just assume that there are people outside of the capitalist system that can be brought in as workers. But if I bring them in as workers, then I need to make sure that there's co sufficient consumer goods that they can buy those consumer goods with their wages. And so that also needs to have been produced in the previous period. Um, and then the third requirement, and this is a kind of more of, this is a less of a material requirement and more of a requirement of the model that I'm trying to make, is that we're looking to analyze equilibrium. In other words, we want to make sure that we are cons consistently in supply-demand equilibrium. So not only do we want to grow and have that these conditions be met, but we also want to make sure that these are that these conditions not just be met, but that they are perfectly met. That there's no extra. That that neither department has produced more than is actually necessary to uh, do the expansion and feed everybody and so forth. So we want to not just have enough, but we want to make sure that we have exactly enough. And you'll, you're, what you're going to see is that those two problems are actually kind of one, two sides of the same coin. Um, so let's check that. How do we check this? So we need to go from 100 to 125 in Department 1, and we need to go from 100 to 110 in Department 2, or at least we're trying to, and we're trying to see if this is possible. Can they do that? Well, like we said, they need a certain amount of raw materials. And how many raw materials do they need? So Department 1 needs uh, C1 times 125. Uh, in raw materials for its expansion. That is to say, it needs one third of 125, uh, which is uh, 42. So they they need 42 hours worth of raw materials in order to go from 100 to 100. To, in order to put out 125 output value, you need 42 hours of raw materials. Likewise, Department Two uh, needs uh, C2 times 110. Uh, which is uh, two thirds times 110, which is 73 around. It's approximate. I'm not really trying to do this perfectly. Um, so the total necessary raw materials in symbols, and this is super important. So total necessary uh, raw materials 
from is uh, c1 y1 of 1 plus c2 y2 of 1. That's what we just found. We just found c1 times y1 of 1 and c2 times y2 of, of 1 right here. Uh, or right here, rather. Um, and so that's equal to uh, 42 plus 73, which is equal to um, uh, uh, 115. So in order to expand in this way, the capitalist society needs to have had available already 115 hours worth of raw materials. Well, they don't. Well, we don't, we don't have 115 hours of raw materials. We have 100 hours of raw materials. And so we don't have enough capital goods to do this kind of growth. There just simply isn't enough available. So just to summarize what we've said, uh, we need 115 hours worth of raw materials to do the growth that we are thinking about. But, but, the, but the raw materials are produced by Department 1, and Department, two, department 1 has only put out 100 hours of output. And so in order to go from 100 to 125, it's just off the table. It just can't happen. Uh, in, order, in order for this growth to happen, it, it just can't, because there's not enough raw materials uh, available. Um, so, so this is addressing issue one up here, right? The, this growth, we, we said there were two conditions, and one was sufficient raw materials. We have, we have confirmed that there are not a sufficient number of raw materials. Let's confirm number two, sufficient consumer goods. Let's think about how many consumer goods are needed to do this kind of growth. Um, and I'm going to put a, a, a box around this specifically, because this is going to be an important thing to note. This is sort of one of the requirements that we're going to have. Uh, and so let's look at the other one. So in consumer goods, in consumer goods, what do we need? Uh, department one needs so much in consumer goods, right? It needs uh, specifically V1 times 125 hours worth. Uh, again, V1 is also one third. And so that is equal to um, uh, uh, 42. So it needs, it needs 42 hours of consumer goods for, it, for its, its output. Uh, department two uh, needs uh, V2 times 110 hours worth. And so, and so V2 times 110, that's going to be one sixth, I believe was V2 times 110, which is uh, around 18. And so at the, at, at the surface, it looks like we only need 60 hours worth of consumer goods, but that's not true. This is just what's required to uh, 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 feed the workers, but the capitalists exist too, and the capitalists are also consuming. Uh, capitalists also uh, consume half their surplus. Uh, this amounts to, so if, so if capitalists are reinvesting a percentage, right, like a is equal to one half is how much of the surplus that they're reinvesting, then the rest of it, one minus a of, of, uh, of uh, S1 times Y1 of zero, that's how much uh, that the capitalists from department one are consuming. So this is what capitalists in department one consume. Likewise, uh, one minus a times s2 times y2 of zero uh, is, is, is consumption in department two. So the total consume, so, so capitalist consumer demand is therefore uh, uh, one half, that's one minus a, uh, times one third, that's s1, times 100, that's what we started with, plus, and the same thing for, for department two. Right, this is you know one sixth of one hundred is the surplus, and then they're consuming half of that, so that's one half. And so if you add all those numbers up, you get uh, twenty five. So there's twenty five hours worth of capitalist consumer demand, and so you have to have consumer goods available for them. So the total output for Department Two therefore needs to be uh, forty two. Uh, that's that's the demand uh, for wage goods for for the goods for the workers in Department One, plus um, eighteen. That's how many that's how many hours in wage goods you need for Department Two plus 25. That's how many, that's the consumer goods demand from the capitalist class. And so if you add those up, you get 85. And so 85 that we do have enough. So uh, we have uh, 100 hours worth of consumer goods. We have 100 hours worth of consumer goods, so we have enough 
So, so condition two is actually met. Uh, condition one is not met. We don't have enough raw materials to do this growth. We do have enough consumer goods to do this growth, but we actually have more than enough. We have 15 hours more than we need. And so three is actually not satisfied, even though two is satisfied, right? We have too many consumer goods. So we don't, we're not gonna have supply demand equilibrium uh, in this scenario. So this 85 is, is enough, but it's not what we're looking for. So uh, we have oversupply of consumer goods. So this growth, we can conclude therefore that the growth that we were starting with here is, uh, is we don't have enough raw materials, but we also have too many consumer goods. And that's the problem. So to summarize, what, what, what we were trying to do is we were, trying, we were thinking about the situation in, capi in which capitalists in the capital goods industries are just going to reinvest in their industries, half of their surplus, and the same thing for capitalists in department two. If they try to do this, uh, they, they won't, they can't do it. It's literally impossible. The, there's not enough there's not enough raw materials and there's too much consumer goods there's too many consumer goods if we're trying to maintain equilibrium that won't do either so there is no such thing as an economy with this kind of growth it just cannot happen so what we've concluded is that in order for reinvestment of half the overall surplus to be possible and and maintain equilibrium there is no way to do it and have the capitalists just reinvesting in their own industries in, in order to do this it has to be we have to allow capitalists to cross over from department one into department two and we have to allow capitals from department two to invest in department one we have to allow capitalists to shift their investments and shift their capital around into different industries that's the only way that that that, that our conditions can possibly be met um and so there's a lot of ambiguity there well, how do you do it and this is something that Marx realized, and that's why Marx's solution doesn't have them investing half. It has the capitalist department one investing half and the capitalist department two right, reinvesting some different percentage. So this is where Marx started to encounter mathematical difficulties. He realized probably very quickly that in order to have exactly half of the surplus reinvested, uh, you would have to think pretty hard about like how much of uh, the capital needs to go into department two and how much of the capital needs to go into department one. Uh, you're going to have to have some moving around, uh, some shifting around of the, of the proportions there. And so note that, and so there's an interesting thing to note, and this is going to be pretty much like where uh, the interesting things start to crop up, which is that in order to reinvest half the surplus, uh, you know, that's what, that's what, you know, we, that's what we're still what we're trying to do. So we're still trying to reinvest half the surplus, but note that whatever way we find to do that, if we find a way to do that, it's probably going to have to be the case that department two is just scaled down. Not only is surplus not going to be invested in Department 2, but it's probably going to have to shrink. The amount of, of total, the percentage of the capital that's invested in the economy is going to shift overall from Department 2 to Department 1. It's going to have to. And the reason, is, the reason for that is because, one, we already have too much of it. Uh, so putting resources into it just is, isn't really important. But also, the more important thing is that it requ you know, that I want you to remember that K1 here is equal to 1 and K2 is equal to four. In other words, the, the consumer goods industry is very capital intensive. It requires lots of raw materials. To reinvest in the department two takes a ton of raw materials and we already have a shortage of them. So there's just no way that any reinvestment can go into department two, not to mention we already have too much of it. So department two is not going to get bigger. Department two is almost certainly going to shrink even if we manage to invest uh, half the surplus back into the society. And this is where I imagine Marx had issues. I think that Mar this is the point where Marx got to and he didn't know how to find uh, what works. So it turns out you can show that there's actually only a single way that you can reinvest half the surplus and have conditions one through three be met. That, 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 you, have, uh, that you have perpetual supply demand equilibrium and that the materials that you need are always available. There's only one way to do this. There's only one pair of numbers that makes this work. And that pair of numbers is 200. Department one needs to go from 100 to 200. And department two needs to go from 100 to 50. So like we said, department one doesn't get bigger, it gets smaller, it gets halved in size. Department one needs to double in size, department two needs to halve in size. And this is the only way to maintain supply demand equilibrium and also have the kind of growth that we're desiring. That's it. That's the only way to do it. And, and this is where Marx, where Marx got stuck. He could not solve for these at all. He had no idea, he would not have been able to solve for this solution, 250. 
He probably tried to find the numbers and he couldn't do it. And that's probably why he resorted to the weird investment scheme that he that he that he went with with in volume two. So we, we can check that this works. Uh, C1 times 200 plus C2 times 50. That's the total raw materials cost for this kind of growth. And we can see that it actually equals if you if you work it out, it ends up equaling 67 uh, plus 33, uh, which is equal to 100. Uh, if you just if you take if you look at the raw materials cost for this for this growth in each department, it works out to be the exact amount that you had in the beginning, which is 100. So that works out. Uh, and then um, uh, a consumer goods cost uh, that's going to be V1 times 200 plus V2 times 50, and then plus again we got to also consider capitalist consumption. So that's going to be uh, 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 and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to define B to equal 1 minus A. Uh, that's going to be capitalist consumption. So I have, cap I have the, the surplus that capitalists, so the proportion of surplus that capitalists are reinvesting is A, and then 1 minus that is the proportion of capitalist consumption because they're, we're, they're presumably consuming the rest, and so that's going to be B. And so I, I would take B, and I would multiply it by S1, and then I would multiply it by my own, my old Y1, which is 100. And then I would also take B and multiply it by S1, or S2, excuse me, and, and also multiply that by my old uh, 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 amount. That's, that's this amount up here. Um, that's the amount we found earlier. Tw that, that's the 25 that we found earlier, right? It's this. This is B times S1 times uh, Y1 of 0. And so if you, if you work this out, if you add these numbers up, you get 100. And so that, that also works out. And this is where Marx got stuck. He couldn't figure out how to solve for these. And solving for these is indeed pretty difficult. In fact, we can, but, but we're also, we're finally in a position where I can write down the system of equations that you would have to solve. So here is the big moment. In general then, so in general, the growth path the capitalists have to follow in order to consume uh, B equals one half of their surplus, and reinvest the rest. Um, must satisfy the following two conditions: that that it has to be the case that the amount of of, of raw materials that I have at time t is exactly equal to C one times Y one of t plus one. That is to say, this is the uh, um, the capital goods requirement of the output after after the period t is over, um, plus c2 times y2 of t plus 1. And this is exactly the formula that I've mentioned a couple of times already. Um, if we scroll way up, uh, it's what we've been checking. It's what I put a box around here, right? It's, it's basically just I'm taking this amount, the total necessary raw materials, and just setting it equal to the old y, y1 of 0. So the capital, I'm just saying that this, this necessary amount is exactly what I have. That's what I'm saying. And if I scroll even farther up, I mentioned it even earlier than that, right here, when we were talking about uh, what, these, what these Y1s and Y2s even were, I made a point to say, you know, of the total output from society, this amount, hey, look, that's exactly what I've written down, has to be made in the previous period. It's this amount. So basically what I'm saying is that this amount that's in the red box here is exactly what I need to... Uh, make the C that I need over in this new day, right? This new period. That, that's what I'm saying. Likewise, Y2 of T, that's equal to V1 Y1 of T plus 1 plus V2 Y2 of T plus 1 plus B times S1 times Y1 of T plus B times S2 times Y2 of T. This, and, and so just to kind of look through this, this is the consumption from the capitalist class in Department 1. This is the consumption from the capitalist class in Department 2. Um, and then this is the amount of, of, of new wage goods that you need to bring in the workers required to facilitate the growth of the both departments combined. That, that's these two numbers here. And so basically, these are the conditions that are necessary. Uh, these, th this is basically conditions 1 and 2 that I mentioned earlier, mentioned in symbols. And the fact that there's an equality here rather than like a greater than or equal to is what is, is essentially condition 3, that you want to have exactly enough. I, I not only have... You know, so to so to put uh, you know greater than or equal to you know this is meeting conditions uh, 
conditions uh, one and two, uh, putting equal signs uh, instead of greater than or equal to uh, meets condition three. And so this is a system of equations that Marx needed to solve in order to actually do the growth that he was trying to analyze in volume two. So let's think about why these equations might have been difficult to solve for Marx. And the answer is actually extremely obvious, which is because these are not the normal equations that you know how to solve unless you've taken like a differential equations class. The solutions to these equations are functions. They're, they're, they're curves, y1 of t, y2 of t. The, the solution is not a number. The solution is a sequence of numbers that always conforms to a set of conditions. Uh, these are, this is the kind of thing that you don't learn how to solve until, you know, like you're finished with calculus. This is, this is something, I mean, now, you know, this is not, uh, uh, you know, when the solutions are functions, it's a much more complicated thing. Not only is, is a, 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 an equation that you're having to solve where you're solving for a function and not a number, but it's also a system of equations. So you could actually replace these with just numbers and you could solve it in the particular case of like 100, 100. Uh, and you could solve for the 250 without solving for the whole function. But even then, you're dealing with a system of equations. And so, you know, uh, I don't think that Marx would have had much trouble solving a system of equations. So at that point, what I have to believe is that he, he had some trouble even writing this down. And you know what? Even that's forgivable. I mean, it took, a it took a good amount of thinking for us to get to the point where this is the thing we knew we had to write down. It's not obvious that the question of how do we have it so that the capitalist class consistently invents, invests uh, a certain proportion of their surplus and also is constantly meeting the requirements exactly for, for doing that. Uh, you know, the process of going from that statement in English down to this, uh, you know, a set of equations, th they, you know, that's not, that's not easy math either. You know, there's kind of two kinds of being good at math. There's the kind that gives you the mathematical kind of maturity to, to get from point A to, to, this, to this kind of mathematical expression. Uh, and that's one kind of like mathematical ability. And then there's the other kind which is solving it. And so he probably had some trouble with both. Just, just kind of expressing the problem is, is a big part of, 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 the, of the difficulty in mathematics. And if you stare at these, it's actually kind of cryptic. Like notice that A is not here anywhere. <laughs> Uh, you know, the main condition is that we're constantly reinvesting A of the surplus, but A is not here. We got B, you know, we've got the, we've got the rate of consumption of the capitalist class here, but, but it's not clear from writing it, this even down that, um, A, you know, A times the, uh, the surplus, the total surplus value is being reinvested into accumulation. Let's see that for ourselves. Um, it, it what is the total amount of surplus? So total t surplus is uh, S1, Y1 of T plus S2, Y2 of T, right? This is the total amount of surplus that you wanna, that you have to reinvest at time T. And so A times that, this is the total amount of surplus that I want to reinvest. And so basically, if I wanted it to be the case that I accumulate this much each period, then uh, we know that capital accumulation amounts to, um, uh, you know, C plus V, that's the size of a capital, right? And so this delta y1, so if I take the change in y1 between periods and then I take you know, the necessary part of that, that's the accumulated capital. So in other words, the amount of new c plus v that I add you know, plus the amount of, of c plus v that I add you know, at, to, to the other department, this has to be equal to this. So basically to, to write this out clearly, um, the condition that we're trying to maintain is that a times the total surplus is equal to c1 plus v1 times delta y1 plus uh, c2 plus v2 uh, times delta y2, um, oops, times uh, delta y2. Um, you know, this is the this is basically the, con the the main condition we started with, in which in which a of the total surplus gets reinvested into accumulation of capital, right? That's that's what I'm saying here, um, but that's not really present here. It is actually. You can show that these two equations imply this one. Uh, by adding the, you, you basically, in order to solve this, you add them together and just, and rearrange. Like, so um, if, I, if I label these equations like one and two, uh, if you add one and two and rearrange, uh, can get this. You can confirm that it is the case 
that A times the total surplus is being reinvested into accumulation, but even that's not obvious from here, right? I mean, so that, that what I'm trying to say here is that like these equations are kind of subtle. Uh, just writing them down it takes a little bit of thinking, and it also takes a little bit of thinking to even confirm once you've written them down that they're what you want. But they are, and we have them now. And so once you have them, you can solve them. Now, now to solve these, uh, you kind of learn how to do it typically at the end of like a differential equations class, even though these aren't really differential equations, they're difference equations, but it's the same kind of uh, idea where you end, up, you end up using some linear algebra. You have to kind of write this in a matrix form and, you, and do a diagonalization. It's, it's not an easy task, especially if you're a trained Hegelian philosopher living in Britain in the year 1860 and you've self-taught yourself all of the math you know and there's no mathematicians nearby to talk to. You know, I mean, it's not, even if he wrote this down, it, it would not have been happening. So, you know, if you're interested in seeing a solution, I've solved this myself, obviously. I'm not gonna go through the process of solving it, but if you're interested in seeing it, uh, you can find a solution by going to my Desmos app and um, scrolling all the way up and then clicking this Google Drive link. If you click this Google Drive link, you'll get a PDF guide to the Desmos app, which is going to, a lot of what's in this PDF guide I'm going to be explaining out loud. But if you scroll all the way down to uh, the appendix, uh, appendix B, uh, I have a few pages where I solve the system. Here's how to solve the system. It starts here. Here's the two equations, as you can see. And uh, it immediately gets um, rather... Uh, you know, it's a little involved, as you can, as you can see, it's a little involved. A co these, these last couple of lemmas are me like proving various things about the solutions, but the solutions are right here. These are the solutions. Uh, you've got a lot of symbols that I had to make up because to write it all out without these symbols is quite a bit of, of, of stuff to write down. But I mean, you know, as you can see, it's a bit of a process. But w once you do solve them, you see that, that for a fixed initial condition of Y1 and a fixed initial condition of Y2, uh, there's only one possible path. There's only one possible um, growth path that, that can satisfy these conditions. You're, in other words, and this is the big thing, this is where we're going to start to get to the crazy results. Um, there's only one way that a capitalist society can develop like this, given an, a specific initial condition. And if that one path to follow tends, ter turns out to not be pretty, well, and that's bad news for, for your pr proposed, like, pure capitalism. And we can already see problems sort of cropping up. Marx couldn't find these two numbers. He was not able to find that this was the solution. He probably looked for it and just wasn't able to find these two numbers. But if he did, then he would have seen something kind of startling that he didn't manage to note in his own uh, book, which is that the department, too, needs to shrink. And what does that translate to? If Department 2 is shrinking, that means capitalists are pulling out of Department 2. That means layoffs. That means mass layoffs. Mass layoffs are inevitable to maintain equilibrium. Think about that. That is, that is a startling result. In order to maintain equilibrium in one of these perfect capitalist societies, in a pure capitalist society in which you're maintaining constant supply-demand equilibrium and obtaining balanced kind of growth, or not balanced growth, but just growth in general, that you're, that you're growing at a consistent rate, you have to lay off half the workers in department two, just from pe one period to another. Not only that, if you were to kind of check the same thing, if you were to check the same two conditions from, from uh, at this state, once you're at 250, you would see that you have the exact opposite problem. If, if you try to grow uh, uh, again, if you try to do this growth a second time with these now as, as where you're at, then that's going to produce the exact opposite problem that we noted before. It's going to be the case that you have way too many capital goods and way too few consumer goods. And so what are you going to see? You're going to see another even more wild swing in the other direction. Department 1 is going to have to shrink now, and Department 2 is going to have to expand. So again, just to think about, like, what, what is the question that Marx was trying to answer in Volume 2? He was trying to answer the question of, like, what does equilibrium growth look like in a capitalist society? All of the political economists at the time, the, the, the utopian political economists that were around at the time, were like, yeah, this would be utopia. If you had a situation like this, it would be great for everybody. Well, what are we seeing? We're seeing that even if you have perfect supply-demand equilibrium, man, that sounds great, right? You're still going to have a highly, often disrupted society. You're going to have society that is violently swinging back and forth between these two departments. You're going you're gonna to have like wild, like disruptions constantly, even even in this situation. So 
In order to make sense of these results, let's finally jump into Desmos and look at the solutions. So if you're in Desmos with me, first of all, I want you to make sure that you have all of the parameters set how they were set when we were initially solving the problem. So you want the, ex the uh, exploitation to be 1, you want rate of reinvestment to be 0.5, uh, you want the composition of capital of the capital goods department to be 1, and you want the composition of capital of the second department to be two, 4, and you want Y1I to be 100, and you want Y2I to be 100. So make sure that you have all those set the way they are. And now let's take a look at what the solutions are. So if you scroll down, go ahead and click these two uh, colored like dotted lines uh, next to the I1 and I2. That'll hide the ideal growth paths that we know are no longer possible. And by the way, I'm just jumping in later to say that if you don't see the functions that I'm talking about, it's because I've got things organized into folders. So if you just click the thing called growth paths of the system, it should open up pretty much every, everything I think that I talk about in this video. And now let's scroll down to the actual solutions. Now, that, now these actual solutions are these ones, Y1, Y, and Y2 here. You have to turn on both of them. Uh, basically, I have a different solution here depending on whether the composition of capital and department and one department is bigger than the other. Never, if, if, if Basically, if you're looking at this Desmo map, Desmos app, if you ever see like two definitions of the same function, just turn them both on if you're going to turn one of them on. Make sure that both are on at the same time. Same thing with this one. And here it is. Look at this. Look at this. Look at how violent this is. I mean, it's it's immediately flies off the screen after after just two. Per this is this is the second period. This is the second production period. By the third, like it doesn't even. I mean, you you jump into the negatives, and we'll talk about that in a second. Like, what does it even mean for values to become negative? I, I, what it means is that is that it's it's just not possible. There's nothing you can do. Like, I mean, it, it, by the what it means for the capital goods to dip into the negative is that you have a crisis on your hand of some sort. It's not a crisis of like overproduction. It's not a crisis of the supply chain breaking down. What it is is it's a crisis of disproportionality. That's really what we observe when we look at this third circuit and what we're finally seeing for ourselves. But let's before we get there, um, let's just you know confirm what we know. So we're starting at 100, just as we as we're aware. And then just as we predicted, by the time we get to one, uh, we've fallen down to 50, right? So here's, uh, you can see, as, as I said, one comma 50 is this, you know, 50 in the capital, this is the wage goods department. So if, uh, an output of 50 from the wage goods department and an output of uh, 200 from the capital goods department, that is the solution. That's what you have to do. This is the only way to maintain constant supply demand equilibrium and to accumulate. You gotta destroy the, cap the, the wage goods department and you've got to just throw everything you have into the capital goods department. And then, lo and behold, the capitalists find themselves in a, in a crisis of the exact opposite sort. Now they have too many capital goods and not enough wage goods. And what you see next is, a, is, an, equally, is, an, is an even more violent swing in the other direction. So bam, you're down here. And now you're, you have an even bigger swing in the other direction. And then after that, it just gets absurd. So you just get these violent swings back and forth, back and forth. And, and, and that's it. Now, what I need to emphasize first is that this, these curves are not the result of the capitalists following price signals. Price signals are a result of supply-demand fluctuations, uh, you know, it, it, dis, disequilibrium in supply and demand. But, but that's the exact opposite of what we have here. These curves are, uh, are what the capitalist class is going to do if they constantly maintain supply-demand equilibrium. And I can't stress that enough. The capitalist class is not going to do this swing because they experience uh, an undersupply of wage goods and an oversupply of cap capital goods. You cannot justify them following these curves by the argument that, okay, they want to stay on, on these ideal growth paths, and if they want to stay on these ideal growth paths, then they experience, uh, you know, per they perceive like a, a, an undersupply of wage goods and an oversupply of capital goods, and that perception leads to a price change, and then they follow those price, price signals, they invest in the most profitable industries, and then they follow these curves. That's not what we're, I mean, they might, they might do that, but that's not what we're saying here. That's not what we're saying here at all. They're not following these curves because of any changes in the price signal. They can't be because we're in constant equilibrium here. They're doing it for some other reason, but that means something insane. What we're saying here, what the, what the solutions to these equations are giving us is that what following price signals is going to do is it's going to bind the capitalist class to these curves. That's what's going to happen. To the extent that the capitalists are humble servants of the market and are adjusting their capital investments uh, according to fluctuations in supply and demand, uh, they, uh, they are going to approximate equilibrium growth. And to the degree that they approximate equilibrium growth, 
That's the degree to which they actually stick to these curves. This is not a prediction. This is what the cap. This is what we're what we're doing here is we're showing this is what the capitalist class will do if they uh, if they do that perfectly. It's not a prediction. It's saying if the capitalist perfectly adjusts to supply and demand, they will find themselves on this curve. That's wild. That's insane. So then the question is like, what is keeping pe what is keeping capitalists on this curve? Why is this why is this what it has to be? Uh, in or if you're trying to maintain uh, equilibrium growth, like what the hell? Why? <laughs> the way that I see doing mathematics is you do the complicated math, you get the complicated result, but then through being able to see the complicated result in kind of its most kind of distilled way, like in a mathematical way, you can at the, you at that point have the tools that you need to come up with an intuitive justification for it. You can explain in a in a simple Marxist vocabulary why this is going to happen, uh, believe it or not. And so let's do that. It has to do with the structure of dependency between the two departments as a result of technology. And so what I mean by that is if you scroll up and stare at these compositions of capital for the two industries, K1 and K2, um, it's really important to understand what these mean. Um, K1 is equaling one and K2 is equaling four. That means that the consumer goods department is more capital intensive than the capital goods department. Likewise, the capital goods department, since it's got a smaller composition of capital, is more labor intensive on the consumer goods department, otherwise known as the labor goods department. So there's an inward facing dependency between these two departments here. When, when you have the case that K2 is bigger than K1, when the, when, the cap, when the consumer goods department, when the labor goods department has a higher composition of capital than the capital goods department, then both departments end up staring at each other because the the Cons the, the labor goods department requires lots and lots of capital goods, and the capital goods department requires lots and lots of labor goods. And so you have this kind of inward facing dependency, and that's what creates these constant oscillations. They're constantly having to orbit each other because they over they're overly dependent on one another for their own kind of activity. And the situation reverses if you flip the situation. If you make the, the capital goods department have a higher composition than the than the labor goods department. If I make this like three, and I make this like one, then what you see is something completely different. You no longer get oscillation. You just get like worse and worse disproportionality. It's still a, it's still a bad time. You still don't want to be like stuck to a path like this. But and it's a, but it's a completely different like phenomena than if you uh, reverse the situation. Uh, so here. Let's let's say this out loud, right? The capital goods department is more capital intensive. That means it's overly dependent on itself and under dependent on the actual other department. Meanwhile, the wage goods department, the labor goods department, is is more labor intensive. So it's more dependent on the thing that it produces. So these are these are facing away from each other now. When you when you have a situation like this, the two departments are like under dependent on one another, and so they veer away from each other. Now that's only kind of an intuitive explanation. It's not the full story. I want to I want to say this in a more sophisticated way. I want to kind of uh, go into more detail about what I just said. But before I do that, let me. I, I, there's something else I need to talk about first, and that's balanced growth. So let's jump back here. I'm going to flip this back to what it was. So let's think about what the capitalist class would want. Uh, the best, the, the only good scenario for a, for, a, for a capitalist class locked into a path like this to the extent that they approximate supply and demand equilibrium uh, is a situation in which both of these curves stay positive forever, at the very least, right? I mean, ideally they should both grow, but at the very least they both need to stay positive. That would be, you know, they both need to keep in this quadrant of, of the XY plane. Um, and so, but the thing is, there's actually only for, for a you can show that basically for a fixed initial condition for the capital goods industry, there is exactly one number that the wage industry can be such that you get that, and the and the same is in, the same is true in reverse. If you fix the wage goods industries or the to be like a specific initial condition, then there's only one initial condition for the capital goods department that will give you growth like that, and you can see it. That's what these two numbers are giving you here. Uh, this number gives you what the capital goods department needs to be given some initial some given some setting of the wage goods department to approximate like the growth that capitalists want 
and this is the uh, this is what the wage goods department would need to be in order to give you what they want. So let me go ahead and ch show you that. I'm going to change this to like 100, um, and I'm going to as I bring this down, you can see towards 77, which is the number displayed here. I you can see that I am getting a more kind of stable situation. It's kind of unraveling into something that kind of stays well more well behaved. You can see now I get. You know, when it, when it's seventy seven point five, I get like three periods worth of like nice, steady growth that the capitalist class can be happy with. It's and you know, if I add a few more digits, you know, let's add like a three and a zero and uh, or a three and a two uh, and a zero and a four, maybe even right. The more digits I add of, of accuracy to uh, to this exact number right here, um, the thing the, the closer I seem to get like nice steady growth between the two departments that wouldn't create a crisis of disproportionality um, and and so there's these kind of ideal balanced growth paths um, in that you can get and what's funny is that you can't get it here unless you type in, like even if I type in every single digit of accuracy here so there's be a four and an eight and a four and a five and an eight now I've, based, I've just copied and pasted this number here for Y2I. Even here, even here, I only get like 15 to 20 cycles before it just explodes. And what's interesting about the way that, this, that, the, um, that, the, that we leave balanced growth, what's interesting about the way that we explode off of like what seems to be like a nice, steady, balanced growth path is that it's, it's always with the same degree of subtleness, no matter how perfect this is, no matter, no matter what the situation, you always kind of have the same structure of leaving balanced growth, which is to say, you get like one minor earthquake, and then one major swing, and then everything is just like completely out of control. Uh, no matter how, no matter what the settings are, I could change this to this, I could change this to this. You can see no matter what, I get like two spikes, right? This one and this one. I get like one earthquake, and then one spike, and then like a crisis. I would say that this is probably like, this, this one right here is probably the crisis. I mean, this would have to be the crisis because again, the value output of, 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 of a department cannot be negative in reality. What, what, this, what this means here, that you go negative here, uh, this, this essentially means that at some point, the capital goods industry just disappears. There are literally no capitalists anymore making capital goods. And so at that point, society would have to acknowledge that there is some kind of crisis going on. And, and, and so you always have the same number of like kind of disruptions before you're in a crisis. That is to say pretty much two, this one, this like minor earthquake, and then this one. Um, and I think that that has like serious ideological consequences. Let's think about this. Here's 100, I'm gonna cut the chords like 77. So let's say our, we start our capitalist system off like this. Um, you know, so uh, we have a crisis. Let's say that we have a crisis and, and during that crisis, the capitalists destroy a bunch of their capital and kind of reset things in that way to something approximate, to, to initial conditions which better approximate this balanced growth. Um, let's say we start off like this. Then you get like one, two, you get about three cycles, uh, three production periods um, in which you do get balanced growth. In other words, there's no warning. It, it, the, the fact that you leave the balanced growth path so suddenly has consequences. I think what the consequence would be is that the, it basically gives the capitalist class just enough time to convince themselves that things are going to work out. It gives them just enough time uh, every every crisis, when things get reset back to some kind of equilibrium that is approximating balanced growth, um, the capitalist class gets a few production periods to convince themselves that just kind of adjusting to supply and demand is going to be enough to avoid these kinds of crises. And then it'll happen immediately without any warning. And then it just repeats themselves and then they reconvince themselves. It's very interesting uh, how sudden, like, I mean, the implications of how sudden you get this divergence from the balanced growth path is, I think, extremely interesting to think about in terms of how it's going to affect people's heads. Um, now, what you can do is if you scroll down below the actual warranted paths, you'll see this like ZG1 and ZG2. These are the balanced growth paths. So I can turn these on and you can see the way that I am diverging from the balanced growth path. You can see, you can see like, this is, this is the perfect balanced growth path. If I go up here, and you know, the, if, even if I type in every single one of these, I won't get this path, but if I set them equal symbolically, if I set this equal to B sub G1, like just write the, le write the letters in, then you can see I do mimic the balanced growth path. I, I am exactly on it. But if I'm even like one digit off,
you know, like something like that, you can see I approximate balanced growth for a very long time. Capitalists convince themselves that everything is going to be fine. You know, supply-demand equilibrium is one-to-one -one with, 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 you know, the, the political economist's utopian paradise. And then all of a sudden, and by the way, I just need to, I, I always need to emphasize to myself even, that even if, even as I leave this balanced growth path, I still have supply-demand equilibrium. This is the path that the capitalists are locked into to the extent that they do manage to perfectly adjust to supply and demand. If they do their jobs perfectly, if they reallocate their capital just as humble servants of the market doing exactly what consumers want, this path, these disproportions are inevitable. That's what we're saying here. We're not predicting they're going to do it. They, they're probably not going to be able to. They're probably going to screw up their supply and demand and create crises in some other way. But even if they did this perfectly, they would, be, they would, they would experience this. But but in in the you know to 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 talk about what we're seeing here in terms of like uh, uh, dynamical systems and chaos theory and stuff is that the balanced growth path is unstable. You've got this balanced growth path, and it's the only way. This is the only way uh, that both of these curves can stay positive at all times. There's only one way. Uh, you know, for a for a, for a fixed initial input of y one i, there's a, there's only one exact like number here that it could possibly be that would give you this balanced growth. And, um, and, and, and it's unstable. It's impossible to stick to. So basically, in, in dynamical systems, you've got, these idea, you've got this idea of like a fixed point, you've got this, which you can kind of interpret in this setting as like an equilibrium condition. And in general, when, when you have systems like this, your equilibrium conditions, which in this case corresponds to balanced growth, it doesn't correspond to equilibrium. This whole thing is equilibrium from the perspective of like supply and demand. But the equilibrium condition is like the balanced growth paths. And in general, these kinds of conditions are either like attractors or like repellers. Uh, you know, you're either going. So if, if this if this equilibrium condition is like an attractor, then no matter where I started the system, it would kind of veer towards it and eventually match on to it. What I have here is the exact opposite situation. If I don't get on it from the beginning, then I am destined to be blasted away from it. It's a repellent force. It kind of it kind of uh, the, the dynamics of the system are centralized around these balanced growth paths, but in such a way that the balanced growth paths just do not want anything to get anywhere near it, and it will push it will push hard away from it, and that's exactly what we see here. Meaning that the and, and so I want to emphasize that the only way to get on to one, uh, get onto this like utopian path is to be on it from the beginning and just have it have these things match up perfectly from the beginning, and if you scroll down way down, way way down and open up this other functions related to the system tab if it's not open and scroll all the way down to this function b and turn it on then you get this line and what this line gives you is is you have to interpret the 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 axes differently basically if you turn interpret the x axis as initial condition for y1 and you interpret the y axis as initial condition for y2 then this gives you every balanced growth path so if i click right here at 7 um uh, then, then this right here, 7.004 for Y1 and 5.43, that should be a balanced growth path. So I, I guess Desmos is kind of not super happy with like, you know, how uh, the accuracy of that. But you can see, you know, 7.004, 5.43, it's basically, you know, the balanced growth path. So I, I, there's some, there might be something with like Desmos is like, I think, I think something going on with the truncating and so forth that, that in all this calculation is making the balanced growth path line slightly off from what it should be um, but the bottom line is that like i have this one dimensional line and the only way to have balanced growth is to be perfectly on this line and so every crisis the capitalist class is going to do something to try to get on this line but they're never going to get perfectly on it i'm never going to match you know i'm you know it's the same it's the same idea if i go out and try to find somebody that's exactly five feet i'm never going to do it they're, they're no one's ever exactly five feet and so it's impossible to get onto one of these balanced growth paths. And in that sense, it's impossible. Every crisis, you're guaranteed to miss uh, the requirements to stay on a balanced growth path. You're going to get crises of disproportionality basically no matter what. It's impossible not to. The best of all possible worlds is unattainable, essentially. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. That's all this is really good for, this, this function here. So the way I'm thinking about it, and the way I think you should think about it, is that you know at this point, around this point where things are going haywire, um, the only way that capitalism is going to um, go back to a system that's producing use values for people in a, in a coherent way 
is through a crisis, through a like radical uh, break in continuity in which a bunch of capital is destroyed and, and the system is reconfigured such that what you end up with is um, initial conditions that better approximate the balanced growth than they did before. In other words, we get to this point, you know, let's say we're like at this point, by the time the society finally recognizes that it has a big problem, you know, where so you have like at that point, you know, society finally admits that they have like an extreme, um, uh, they have like an extreme undersupply of wage goods and an extreme un oversupply of capital goods, even though supply and demand signals don't show them that, they just finally admit it. And um, because they're in the middle of some kind of crisis, who knows what that crisis is. Um, and then they kind of reset things. So let's say, you know, because they have a, an extreme undersupply of wage goods, an extreme oversupply of capital goods, uh, let's say that a bunch of the capital goods just get completely destroyed. You know, I'm thinking about things along the lines of like, you know, when the COVID pandemic started and you had farmers just slaughtering their pigs, you know, they're just kind of, you know, just people getting rid of their fixed capital because it's just, they just have finally have realized that it's useless and, and, you know, isn't, isn't what society needs and so forth. Obviously the pig thing isn't quite fitting that, but, um, you know, you get the idea. A lot of capital is destroyed every time there's a crisis. And in this case, the only logical capital to destroy is the con is the capital goods because you have too much of them. So let's say we do that. Let's say the wage goods are like, you know, 500. And so let's, you know, so the crisis happens around there and you destroy a lot of the constant capital, but you keep the wage goods. And so let's say we're at 500 wage goods. And then at that point, what the constant capital needs to be, or sorry, what the, what the capital goods department needs to be in terms of output to get something approximating balanced growth is 644. So let's go ahead and do that. And so this is what we end up with. Once the crisis is over, we're here now, let's say. Maybe, maybe I'll add like one more, I'll say like 0.89. So the crisis ends and, and the, the, capital, the capitalist systems like central administrators, whether that's a state or, or who knows, has stepped in and reset things to something approximating equilibrium or, or the, sorry, I should say it like this. Now the, the capitalist system steps in and it resets, uh, it's, it resets the initial conditions such that equilibrium is a better approximation of balanced growth. Um, that's what we're doing. We're, we're basically fixing initial conditions such that the balanced growth path, the only balanced growth path that's viable um, is, is, uh, is going to, is going to uh, be, be approximated essentially. And it'll be, and, and, you know, to the degree that they do a good job of that, they buy themselves some time. You get one, two, three, four, you know, with, with two, with, with, um, you know, if they get, if they match this up to like one hundredths, uh, or, or like, to like within a thousandths of accuracy, then you buy yourself like five or six cycles before things get out of control, before things start to diverge from balanced growth. And then you're back to a crisis. And then, I mean, it lo looks like the crisis will be of the same sort again, where you have too many, uh, Wait, uh, capital goods, not enough wage goods, and then things get reset back, and and it just kind of happens like that. So you have these periodic crises of disproportionality. That's and that's really, I think, uh, the conclusion that Marx was trying to reach. So I want to kind of summarize that because that is, I believe, what the punchline to Volume Two was supposed to be. But before I do, I want to return to this question of like, why are we locked into this? Because I didn't give a full answer. I said some stuff about the compositions of capital. Um, but I, I really needed the, the language of balanced growth paths to kind of uh, explain it further than that. So I think that one we need to start with is the one that I had to stare at to get a sense of what the hell was going on here. And that is the other case, the case when, when the capital goods department is more capital, the capital intensive and the, and the one where the wage goods department is more wage goods intensive. So let's flip this completely around. Let's just make this one four and let's like this one like two. And what you see is this kind of a situation. And then we kind of, let's go ahead and uh, make things make things look a little less chaotic. I'll make this something like 45, um, maybe 0.34. And so you can see what we have here is a situation in which uh, we just simply diverge from the balanced growth path, right? The, the, we don't get oscillation here, we just get divergence. So I wanna make sense of this. Um, and it's a little hard to make sense of this because you can't talk about supply demand uh, disequilibrium. It, it's it's ha I might be here like at at, the, at 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 period four. I don't necessarily have a crisis yet, um, but like this is supply demand equilibrium. The capitalists are doing their job if they stick to this. So I can't really talk about supply demand disequilibrium to justify these paths. These paths the, these the, these paths are are happening for a completely different reason. 
uh, than any kind of uh, following price fluctuations due to supply-demand disequilibrium. It can't be that because we are in constant supply-demand equilibrium. There has to be some other reason. Nonetheless, it's, it's kind of useful to be able to talk about supply and demand disequilibrium to understand this. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that I didn't just say that, and I'm going to explain the problem in terms of some supply and demand issues, and then we'll return and, and be able to convert that explanation into something that's more um, correct uh, by thinking about the balanced growth paths. So I just want to warn uh, uh, the viewer that like these explanations are kind of confusing. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that it's kind of the same thing. I'm going to be saying the same thing like four or five times in a row. And so if you don't fully understand the, the when I say it the first time, then you might understand it the fourth time. E either way, um, don't worry too much. Th this is basically, I'm just adding this to explain, you know, why the curves look the way they do. Basically what I'm about to do is I'm going, to, I'm about to save about 5% of my viewership from uh, a massive migraine trying to figure this out by inducing a light headache on everybody watching this. Uh, it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. So we're looking at the case. So I'm, I'm returning to the PowerPoint for a minute. Uh, we're, looking for the, we're looking at the case when the capital goods industry is, is, when K1 is greater than K2, that is to say the capital goods industry is more capital intensive, the wage goods industry is more wage goods intensive. So what we have here to begin with, actually, which one do we have? Um, yeah, we have the situation here first. So suppose I have an oversupply of capital goods and an undersupply of wage goods. Uh, the obvious thing to do in this situation is to shift capital away from the capital goods industries and towards the wage goods industry, right? That would be the logical thing to do. I have too many of one thing, too little of another, so just take the capital from one place and push it to the other place where it's more needed, right? The thing is that the compositions of capital, K2 being smaller than K1, throws a bit of a wrench into this. So if I want to shift capital into the wage goods industries, um, then because the wage goods industries are more labor intensive, I'm going to be creating an economy which consumes wage goods at a higher rate, but I have an undersupply of wage goods. So in order to solve the problem, I have to shift capital goods into the wage goods industries, but doing so uh, changes the composition of capital of society as a whole. It's, it's going to take more labor now to, it's, it's generally just going to like make society more labor intensive. And I can't do that because I have an undersupply of wage goods. So I, I, the, the obvious way to solve the problem is actually probably gonna make the problem worse. It also creates an economy on the other side of this, we could say this in the, in the, in the reverse direction, you know, if I shift capital away from the capital goods industries into the wage goods industries, then I'm creating a good, a, 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 an economy which consumes capital goods at a, at a lower rate for the same reason. I'm creating a more labor intensive society. And so I'm going to be consuming less capital goods, but I have an oversupply of capital goods. So that's also problematic. And so the solution exacerbates the problem. The solution isn't a solution at all. Uh, things just don't work out. The, technolo the technology difference makes the, the, the solution impossible. And so I get locked into an economy which looks like this, in which the problem just gets worse and worse. Now, of course, here, I don't have uh, uh, a, a notion of like oversupply of capital goods and undersupply of wage goods, but I do have this balanced growth path. And so we have to just kind of change the language a little bit. Now, I didn't mention this, but these balanced growth paths that we have turned on right now sort of give an implicit bias to department one over department two. Basically, it's, it sort of almost repeats Marx's problem, where department two it, it has all of the you know all, the, all of the all of the impetus is on department two to fix the problem, right? If I move this slider around, you can see that the balanced growth path it always pretends that the balanced growth path is like exactly what it's supposed to be, right? The, the dotted line is always kind of where the, 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 the solid line is, and then this moves away from it. And then the idea is that you can shift this around and move the red line closer to the dotted line in order to kind of approach equilibrium. Um, but it sort of, it sort of uh, gives agency to the capital goods industry and takes it away from the wage goods industry. Um, and, and that's sort of like a choice I had to make, because otherwise the balanced growth path is a little bit ambiguous. But the thing is, I actually made a mistake initially, and I had the balanced growth paths defined wrong. And so below these balanced growth paths, we have these actually, what I'm calling them is, is, is 
almost balanced growth paths. It sort of averages out the, the issues between the two uh, departments. And I think these are actually very useful for understanding why these curves do what they do. If you turn them on, you can see that there's almost no difference at all. There's almost no difference at all between the balanced growth paths and the almost balanced growth paths. Um, because it was, a, it was a little typo that defined them for me. But if you turn these off and leave the other ones on, then what it does is it sort of, it sort of shifts the blame and, and, and kind of uh, equalizes the blame for the disproportion from balanced growth, the disequilibrium from balanced growth. It, it, sort of, it, sort of, it sort of shares the blame for it between the two departments. So these aren't actually balanced growth paths. They're sort of like the average of two balanced growth paths. But they also kind of show you what the issue is. And if I zoom in real far, you can see that I'm very close to the balanced growth path with my initial conditions, but I have a slight disproportion in which there are too many capital goods and too few wage goods. It's not really oversupply, undersupply. It's more just like a trajectory thing. But the thing is that these growth paths are staring at, are thinking about that. They're thinking about where things are headed and what needs to be done to maintain supply demand equilibrium. And so I think what you can say is that like from the perspective of, um, of approximating balanced growth, it's not so much that I have an oversupply or undersupply, but I do have a disproportion in which there are too many of one thing and too little of another. And so I can kind of pretend that I have oversupply, undersupply. And, and you see that, you know, from the perspective, if you just kind of replace the idea of like oversupply, undersupply with like above and below balanced growth, then the conclusions are the same. I end up having to veer away. And the reason for that is that the compositions of capital are configured such that the capital goods department is over-reliant on itself. And the wage goods department is also over-reliant on itself. And so to, to, to fix, to address that disproportion, it's, it's counterproductive. <laughs> it's counterproductive to address the problem. The problem is the solution. It's all the same. And so you just end up diverging from balanced growth, just, you know, in the opposite directions. Um, if I change the problem up, if I change Y2 a little bit, like make it a little bigger, then I can bring the solid line above the dotted line and you'll see the phenomena changes. If I bring the solid line here above the dotted line, then I end up with an undersupply of capital goods and an oversupply of wage goods, kind of. Again, supply and demand are in equilibrium. I'm just kind of saying words that, that, that are allowing me to talk about this. But basically, I'm below balanced growth with respect to the capital goods. I'm above balanced growth with respect to the wage goods. And so I get divergence, but in the opposite directions. The wage goods industry soars, the capital goods industry uh, 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 plummets in the sense. And, and, and the reason that they do that is because um, they're just doubling down on the problem. The problem ends up being doubled down on in this case. And so let's just repeat ourselves in this new case. So why am I locked into this trajectory in this new case where I have an oversupply of wage goods and an undersupply of capital goods? Um, the obvious thing to do in this case would be to shift capital away from the wage goods, uh, which I have an oversupply of, and into the capital goods industries, which I have an undersupply of. So can I do this? Well, to shift capital into the capital goods industries, so to shift the wage goods capital into the capital goods industries, creates an economy which consumes more capital goods because the uh, composition of capital in the capital goods industries is bigger. And But that's the thing I have an undersupp undersupply of, so I can't do that. And on the, on the flip side, it also creates an economy which consumes less wage goods, but I have an oversupply of that. And so again, the solution is incompatible with the problem. And, and, and the result is, is an economy in which maintaining supply demand equilibrium locks society into a growing disproportion between the two departments. To the extent that the capitalists actually navigate supply demand correctly, they will create a disproportionality crisis. Um, and so that's why you get a curve that looks like this. Um, now, if I, now let's flip the switch situation again and analyze the other one. I'm going to make this one just like it was in the beginning. And I'm going to make this four. And now we're in the oscillatory case. Um, and I'm going to kind of give myself a little bit of a better equilibrium than that. I'm going to bring this a little down. I'm going to bring this a little up, something like that. And you can see, okay, so I start out with that. It's not so much that I have an oversupply of capital goods and an undersupply of wage goods, um, but I do have a disproportion from the balanced growth path. I'm off from the balanced growth path in the sense that there are too many capital goods and too many wage goods. So what the warranted growth path is doing, what the, what the curve is sort of doing is it's staring at where I am and it's thinking about what it can do to maintain supply demand equilibrium. 
So keep that in your head as we analyze the other situation, the reverse side of the problem. So case two. Case two is when things are inward facing. Both departments sort of face each other. You have that the capital goods department consumes all of the labor, uh, all the labor goods, and that the wage goods department consumes all the capital goods. So both departments are over-reliant on each other. And so they overcompensate for each other. So let's think about that. Suppose I have an oversupply of capital goods and an undersupply of wage goods. So if I shift capital into the wage goods industries, well, the wage goods industries consume all the capital goods. So I'm gonna create an economy which consumes more capital goods. But in that case, this is great because those are the things I have an oversupply of. So the solution is, is it's, a, it's, an ultra, it's, an, it's an ultra solution because not only am I making more capital goods, I'm also, I'm also uh, addressing the oversupply problem by consuming more of them in the process of making more of them. It also consumes, it creates an economy which consumes less wage goods. So I'm making the economy less wage goods dependence as I address the undersupply of wage goods. Things kind of fall into place here, but they fall into place too fast and too hard. And so the solution overcompensates for the problem. On the other hand, if I have an undersupply of capital goods and an oversupply of wage goods, which again, you can just replace the supply demand framing of this with the same kind of framing with respect to the balanced growth path, just kind of make this a little bigger, bam, now we're here. Uh, to shift capital into the capital goods industries is going to create an economy which consumes more wage goods, and that's great because I have an oversupply of those. It also creates an economy which consumes less wage goods, less co capital goods, excuse me, and that's equally great because those are what I have an undersupply of. And again, the solution is overly compatible with the problem. It overcompensates. And so the result is to maintain supply-demand equilibrium is to create uh, wild swings back and forth. And because you're constantly, you're going to constantly swing back and forth. You can see, you know, I'm constantly orbiting balanced growth. I'm constantly swinging into the balanced growth path and I'm constantly missing it. Every single time I just miss, I, 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 I overcompensate each time. I, I go down, I go up, and then I miss the balanced growth path. I'm trying, but there's, I, there's, I just can't quite make it. And every, every time I swing back, it's worse than before. And so that's why you get such different curves depending on the composition of capital. And I think it's really interesting to think about as a question, which reality are we in? What's the technological, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I've, I have no idea. Maybe like something Anwar Sheikh has written or something has information on this, but like, yeah, which of these is actually bigger? What's our reality like? Or do we have a more capital intensive capital goods department and a, and a, and a more labor intensive uh, labor goods department or, or, or the reverse? Because you'll see when we start to think about the other uh, variables that are changing um, in the next video, uh, we're gonna see that like they, that has consequences. The, the nature of the crisis is going to be different depending on, on what, kind of, what kind of technological situation we have here. Um, so I, that's just an interesting open question in my head. Um, so yeah, that's why these paths are what they are. That's why you get these wild swings, even if supply and demand are maintaining equilibrium. And, and so to the extent that the capitalists make, maintain equilibrium, that's the extent to which they stick to these curves and create this problem. <laughs> So at this point, I'd like to summarize and, and, and basically lay out what I think that uh, if Marx was able to do what he wanted to do, would have been the punchline to volume two. If volume two was a finished work in which he was able to solve the systems that he wanted to solve, I think he would have come to a set of conclusions that were the punchline of volume two. And I want to, I want to summarize those now. So basically what we've looked at is that we have these three circulations between the two departments. We have the two intra-departmental intra circulations and we have the interdepartmental circulation. And within each of these three circulations, we see a different kind of crisis. I said in the last video that the crises of overproduction were like the main crisis and like foundational to capitalism. And I, I no longer believe that. Uh, I think that it is one of three uh, crises that are foundational to capitalism. We have the crisis of overproduction that we see when we look at, at the intra-departmental two cycle, we have the, uh, or circuit. We have the, uh, the crisis of, of the supply chain that we see when we look at the, at the first circulation. And then we, when we look at the third, what we see is that it is the home of a different kind of crisis, the crisis of disproportionality. And this is a much more powerful conclusion because unlike circulations one and two, these are much more built in and much more inevitable. And, and, the re and they're in the more inevitable in the sense that they arise in a purer form the closer we get to a pure capitalism. So the political economists of, of Marx's time believed that when capitalism was allowed to settle into a pure state, 
in which market relations drove production in its entirety, and in which the rate of profit had been equalized so that reinvestment decisions were purely a function of supply and demand, then the capitalists would be forced into a, the role of, of humble servants adjusting production to maintain perfect equilibrium. And they believed that such a situation would develop into a utopia. Like they, they, they saw the idea of like a, a, a capitalist class that was maintaining perfect equilibrium. And they said to themselves, perfect equilibrium, that sounds great. And Marx challenged this question. He, he questioned this belief. He wanted to ask the question, well, what does a purely and perfectly functioning capitalist society in perpetual equi equilibrium actually look like? What comes out of the society? What, what is the actual, like, what comes out of the society in terms of use values? Does this really produce good outcomes for people in terms of the stuff that it spits out? What kind of growth do you actually get? This is the question that he wanted to answer. And the answer he got, the answer he would have gotten if Marx was able to solve his own system is pure chaos. He would have shown that even if nature and labor per were perfectly obedient and always available, and even if there were no problems of the supply chain, and even if there was no crises of overproduction and capitalists were perfectly able to maintain supply and demand all the time, that you would still, despite all of those things being perfect, you would still encounter periodic crises of disproportionality. You would have seen that a society of this form would have shown itself to be wildly disruptive and unstable. As capital violently sloshes back and forth between the departments, workers will find themselves routinely laid off en masse. He would have shown that with each crisis, the capitalist class will always attempt to reconfigure the outputs of the two departments to achieve something more approximate to balanced growth, but we've also shown that this balanced growth path is unstable, and so they're inevitably going to fail in their attempts to achieve balanced growth. In other words, there is a situation in which balanced growth can be achieved, uh, but, it's, but it's impossible to attain. Uh, and so they'll buy themselves, at most, each time there's a crisis, they'll only buy themselves a few cycles of steady growth. We've also seen that this crisis of disproportionality is abrupt and sudden when it shows up. And so we've, show we've seen that because of this, this gives the capitalist class periods of calm in which they can convince themselves that market mechanisms work perfectly. In other words, they will never learn their lesson. And that's also built into the system. Um, and finally, it's worth noting that, um, the, you know, it, it, with respect to why these crises of disproportionality are crises of disproportionality, it's worth understanding that the demand that we're seeing here, uh, that, we're, that we've been talking about, is really effective demand. And so what I mean by that is that if, it, if a worker gets, becomes unemployed for some reason, uh, then, then, and then they're not a member of society within our model. In other words, um, the demand for subsistence has no bearing on the supply and demand being measured. The only demand that matters is the demand for wage goods, given the wages that we are paying the workers. We basically, uh, what, what, is, what is supply and demand equilibrium? Within our model, supply and demand equilibrium is uh, when you have exactly as many uh, wage goods as there are wages given out to the workers. If a worker is not being given wages, if they're unemployed, then their demand has no, is not really demand. It's, it, it doesn't exist. And so if you, if you have like mass layoffs um, and, and if you have a mass of workers that don't have jobs, then this supply and demand equilibrium being met by the capitalist class, and I do believe this is the supply and demand equilibrium that will be met by the capitalist class. You know, effective demand is, is only really the only real form of demand in a system like this, I think. Um, then, uh, you know, you, see ex you, you can see more clearly at that point why there's going to be a crisis. And the, th the thing that we haven't talked about that we're going to talk more about in the next video is that as capital sloshes from like a more labor intensive industry to a more capital intensive one, that's going to involve laying off workers in the former industry. But, but because we're shifting our, our, the total social capital into a more capital intensive uh, department, those workers laid off are going to find the demand for their labor lacking. They're not going to get rehired because the demand for labor will be smaller in the more capital intensive department. And so these workers that have been laid off, that their demand no longer matters, supply and demand are still in equilibrium, uh, but you've got a giant mass of workers that are going hungry even despite supply demand being in perpetual equilibrium. And so you can see, I think, much more clearly at that point why these crises of disproportionality are going to turn into crises. There's other reasons for it, and we'll talk about those in the next video as well. But this is the conclusion that I think Marx was trying to reach from volume two. I think he was trying to derive 
this this idea of a crisis of disproportionality and show what the consequences of that would be. And I think that we've done that here. And I can't believe that I forgot to mention one of the most important conclusions of all that you that we should have that Marx should have gotten at the end of volume two, which is that the crises are a feature; they're not a bug, because if the only way for uh, if you're guaranteed to leave balanced growth uh, in a perfectly functioning capitalist society, then crises become an essential feature of of any capitalist society because they they serve the purpose of bringing things back to balanced growth. That you know if 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 even if everything is perfect, you end up going off of balanced growth, then the only thing that will bring you back onto balanced growth is a crisis, or or close to it, and 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 since we'll never get there, we're guaranteed to just get you know uh, another one. So th you know they're guaranteed and they are and they're created. Capitalism needs them and it makes them and it uses them. There's a second purpose as well, but we'll talk more about that in the next video. It has to do with technology, but. Uh, I think that, that the crises in capitalism serve two essential purposes, and we've identified one of them. And now that we've seen what I think Marx intended to see, I want to return, and I want to look at his own version of this. I want to look, I, I said I wasn't going to go through his own numerical examples, and I'm still not, but I do have within my own Desmos app uh, his model. You, we, let's, let's look at his, let, let's look at what he ended up with. I think we can understand it better now. So if you scroll down to these M functions, before we jump down to them, let's actually turn off the current functions that we have on, which are, should be the, probably the Ys and also these almost balanced growth paths. So let's turn everything off and then let's turn on these M functions. This, this is Marx's reproduction schema from volume two. Um, it's it's not, an, I mean, it, the, the, the numbers are wrong. So let's go ahead and fix the numbers. So I have the, the numbers written down from the books here. Uh, if you make the initial y1 6,000, and then uh, I think I remember the numbers. The initial y1 needs to be 6,000. The initial y2 needs to be 3,000. Um, uh, e needs to be 1. A needs to be half. And then I believe k1 was 4, and k2 was 2. This, uh, and then, of, of course, we need the scaling is off now. So let's go ahead and change the y-axis from, like, minus 100 to, like, uh, 10,000. Uh, and here is Marx's reproduction schema. You can see for yourself if you type the, if you, if you've configured the society this way, uh, with the right initial conditions and, and the right rate of exploitation and all that, that you do end up getting the exact same numbers that he calculated. You can see here 6,000, 3,000. If you get to one, uh, you get, uh, uh 6,600 along with, um, uh, 3,200, and then you get, uh, 3,520, and you get, 7,260, you can see that these are the numbers that he ends up with in his book. This is Marx's reproduction schema from volume two. Um, and you can see it's balanced growth. And you can also see kind of the sort of, uh, no offense to him, ass pulley nature of what he was doing, I think very clearly visually here. Because um, it's it's a little less clear the way he sets it up. You can see that like your pro it, it, it all happens right here. If you, um, basically what he has happening is that he has, um, oh, hold on one second. Basically what he has happening is that the capitalists in department two immediately like uh, scramble to snap onto uh, a, a balanced growth path. Basically what he, what he had, what he did, whether he realized it or not, was that the capitalists in department two from, from the very first period would just scramble and do whatever is necessary to achieve balanced growth and then stay on that. And then at that point, the balanced growth path, you know, it's stable if you're on it, you know, if you're on a balanced growth path, you're gonna stay on a balanced growth path. So basically within the first period, the capitalist in department two do whatever is necessary to achieve perfect balanced growth. And then you have perfect balanced growth after that. That's what Marx's, that's what Marx's system did. And so because of that, he only was able to see balanced growth. He wasn't able to see the crises of disproportionality that he was looking for. Um, and it's funny because if you move around this slider, uh, you know, you change up, you know, the way that the capitalists in Department 2, you don't, it's interesting because you don't change anything at all about the system except for that initial scramble of capitalists in Department 2 to achieve, like, to jump onto a balanced growth path. And so you can see uh, what's really interesting is if you go up to here, if you go, like, above what it has to be, then what is going on here? is that you have capitalists in department two literally starving themselves and downsizing their own industries to jump into a, to, to, to achieve balanced growth within one period. That's what, that's what's going on here. 
and you can see that it's it's very discontinuous too. I mean, it is it's continuous, but it's not you know it's it's jagged. It's a very sudden jump to uh, to balanced growth, and then you achieve balanced growth, and you stay on it. Now, this is not actually our balanced growth. If you no matter what you do with our own curves, um, I'll, I'll look at the balanced growth paths. You can see that our balanced growth is actually not the same as Marx's balanced growth, and the reason for that is because um, he only has capitalists in Department 2 reinvesting uh, half their surplus. Um, the capitalists in Department... So, sorry, he only has the capitalists in Department 1 reinvesting their own surplus. The capitalists in Department 2 um, are, are at that... Once they achieve balanced growth, they are reinvesting their surplus at a fixed rate, but it is not necessarily one half. In fact, it almost... I think it never is. And you can see that here. What I have here is like these two functions are. This is the this is the uh, rate of reinvestment for um, the capitalist class. Let me make this y-axis. Let me let me just go ahead and change this y-axis from like you know negative 0.5 to one, so that we can see this more clearly. So you can see this is the rate of reinvestment of the capitalist in Department One, and you can see that it's always 0.5. If you turn on these two curves, then what you get is this is the re rate of reinvestment for capitalist in Department Two. And you can see they, they immediately downsize because the rate of reinvestment is negative until they finally get to uh, balanced growth. And then at this point, they get to like a growth rate, which will be nice and play, play nicely uh, with the growth of, of, of Department 1. And you can see that their rate of reinvestment is, is perpetually the same as well, but it's, it's, it's 30 percent. It's not 50 percent. So once the capitalists in Department 2 achieve like a, a comfortable... Uh, a point, then they start to reinvest at a completely separate rate from the capitalist department too, and that's why you're not you're, you'll never be able to make our curves match with his. Now let's think about the question of like why is this point three and this point five? Um, the reason is because of the issues that we've been noting that cause these crises of disproportionality in the first place, which is um, which is differences in the compositions of capital. Uh, point three is a rate of reinvestment for department two which, given the compositions of capital, plays nicely with uh, the rate of reinvestment of one-half in Department 1. And if I were to change this, I, I'll, I'll bet you, I haven't actually checked this yet, but I'll bet that if I made K2 bigger than K1, then this red line would go above this blue line. Let's check. Sure enough, I'm right. So the capitalists basically, within Marx's model, like achieve a rate of reinvestment, which uh, essentially just matches whatever is, is whatever plays nicely, depending on the technological state of society, uh, with those of Department 2. But either way, you don't have the system that he wanted to talk about. The system that he wanted to talk about was one in which capitalists, on average, were reinvesting the, a, a, a specific percentage of the surplus. He, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's unnatural to believe that the capitalist in Department one, uh, sorry, the capitalists in Department Two, even if they snap on to the right, uh, you know, balanced growth path, that they're going to, on the whole, reinvest like less than the capitalists in Department One. Why would they? It would be much more natural just to assume that the average capitalist invests a certain amount, uh, and and that, that amount would be the same no matter what capitalist or what industry you're looking at, right? That average should be the same. It should be an average. So to have it be consistently different like this is is also, I think, not what, what Marx wanted, but it's what he ended up with. Um, however. I think what Marx did come up with here um, is an interesting addition to the model that we've come up with. So I'm, I changed the scale again, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off these balanced growth paths and just stare at his paths. I think what we have here, I think this does fit in within our own discussion. I think what, what Marx has given us here is a model of the crisis itself. Because again, what is the crisis? The crisis is the crisis of disproportionality in which things wrap, things like suddenly break from their, from their trajectory and try to get and, and attempt to approach balanced growth. And what you have here is a rapid scramble to try to achieve some kind of balanced growth again. So, you know, what we have here is very similar to what you would see during a crisis. Now, so basically what Marx ended up modeling was the resolution to a crisis, which was perfect. That, 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 that situation that we said was like impossible because it was probability zero. You can't just, you know, the capitalists in Department 2 here are reaching this one perfect number. 3,516.145 3, like or whatever, and then going from there. They'll reach whatever number is, at, is, is necessary up to any degree of precision. And so what Marx has given us here 
is a model of the impossible situation of a crisis resolving into balanced growth because the, the capitalist in apartment two give you like that perfect initial condition and then things proceed from there. And um, this is why there so many people stare at volume two, especially right after it was written, like the early Marxists in the, in the early 20th century, a lot of them read volume two and, and they didn't really like what they, what they were walking away with. They would basically say it, it you know, Marx made it seem like capitalism could just like, kind of go on forever. He didn't seem, and, and, and they were right. He did make it seem that way. He tricked himself into that. <laughs> Uh, he, he accidentally, through his like uh, investment schema that he, he came, came up with to basically make the math doable, uh, he accidentally found himself locked into balanced growth every time. And so he made it look like a capitalist system could maintain itself forever. And so a lot of people, you know, s struggled, including Marx himself, to come up with like takeaways from his own model. And, and I think a lot of people have seen it like now as like some kind of disequilibrium model where he's, what, what he's doing really is like listing out the conditions that need to be made that made for like perfect balanced growth and saying that capitalists will fail to do this. I don't think that's what Marx was trying to do at all. I think what Marx was trying to show is that even if they do this, you're still going to get bad outcomes. And that's what we've shown, that this balanced growth path is not something you can expect, uh, e even if you get supply and demand equilibrium, even if capitalists do everything right. He's not just saying that capitalists have to do all of this stuff right and won't. He's saying that even if they do, you're still not going to have a good time. This pure capitalist system that you see these people on Twitter like yelling about all the time, you know, the problem is you haven't done capitalism pure enough yet. Well, here's what happens when you do capitalism pure enough. Not this. You don't get this. Uh, you get this. This is what this is your pure capitalism. This is what your pure market economy gives you. Chaos. That's that's what Marx was showing in Volume Two, or he would have shown if he could do the math. But we've completed it for him, and I really do think uh, I'm going to regret you know saying this in a YouTube video in two years or whatever. But I really do think this completes the argument he was trying to make in volume two. That's it's certainly what it seems to me right now. Um, uh, I think this is what he was trying to show. So what we're seeing here and what we've, all, what we've already seen like over and over and over and over again up to now is that there are deep contradictions between use value and value um, in, in the sense that um, the pursuit of value doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the pursuit of things that we find valuable or the pursuit of a lifestyle that we find valuable or the pursuit of use values that we like or the pursuit of anything else besides itself. What is value? Value is time. And so to accumulate value is to accumulate people's time. That's not necessarily a good thing. And in fact, it kind of sounds when you put it that way, like a bad thing. So when I started making these videos, I, I sort of made the conscious choice to not explicitly define use value and exchange value, but instead to just simply point out um, that there are two worlds interacting. There are two worlds at play in all of this stuff we looked at. I pointed out with the, with the rate of profit art discussion that the rate of profit said one thing when you were talking about value, but when you look at it in terms of the actual stuff, it says something completely different. And I think that that's, you know, uh, I, I never actually explicitly said what I meant with use value, although I've used the word several times already. But I think at this point, like, it should be very clear what I mean by that. I think people probably have picked up on it. I mean, that, that's my hope anyway, that I never had to define use value up front, but rather could just allow this contradiction between use value and value, or use value and exchange value, to kind of pr crop up and present itself as we survey everything else. Th this is the exact opposite of how Marx does it. In Capital Volume 1, in the very beginning, what Marx starts with is, is pointing out that we take we tend to look at commodities and see them in two completely different and often conflicting ways. We look at we look at a commodity and what we see, you know, on the one hand is an object of use, something that we could potentially utilize in some way. And then on the other hand, we see it as a number. We see it as uh, a, a, an amount of exchangeability with other things. Uh, we see it as, as an amount of, of value. And I think that he does that first and foremost so that he can point out as we go, as he goes through the whole, uh, through all of his arguments, that the fact that value, the fact that this exchangeability can be hoarded and can be accumulated and that it's universal, it can be exchanged for anything at all, uh, leads to a fixation on the value form and not the use form of things. I, I, you know, whenever I say, you know, let's think about things in real terms, I have, to put, I have to stop and say, let's think about things in real terms. We have this tendency to fixate on the value, the value side of our world. 
there's 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 another world active at all times within capitalism. There's the there's the world that you see around you, and then there's the world of value. And the world of value is it's an abstract world, but it, it has real consequences, and we fixate on it. We, we, we live in one world, but then we think in terms of another. We, 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 we focus on the value form. And, and, and what Marx, I think, is trying to point out in Capital in general is that this fixation on the value form, on exchangeability, on the value side of our world, pr produces decision-making and incentive structures that don't necessarily lead to desirable outcomes in, in the real world, in the use-value side of the world. And I think that that's what we're seeing here very clearly, is that uh, a society that is perfectly rationally adjusting itself according to value uh, doesn't necessarily produce rational outcomes in terms of anything besides value. <laughs> and so the issue here is the value form. The issue here is thinking about accumulation this way. Right. The what, what is what? What about this model that we've been looking at? Um, this model of accumulation is producing this kind of problem. What's producing this kind of problem is the obsession that we have with one number and one number only, and that is value. What we are trying to accumulate under capitalism is value. It's not anything else. And so when you and, and when you're working exclusively on that one signal, you're gonna get chaos because you can't coordinate everything in terms of that one signal and so you know marx often in volume two will stop and 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 say things along the lines of like you know he'll speculate he'll say things like well in a socialized economy you'd have to do this and that and and he orbits around this idea of of you'll need to plan your economy he doesn't say that a government needs to do it or that a state needs to do it he just says that, that some kind of planning on a, on a large scale is necessary. And I think that the implications that this disproportionality kind of argument uh, has for a, a potential planned economy is, is it's a warning that you have to think about things in terms of use values. You cannot think about things purely in terms of values. Now, whether or not people think of value as value, as something that you want to used to exchange for everything else that you want to accumulate and so forth, then the value form surely does not exist in your society. However, everything still ha everything under socialism will still have an amount of labor kind of implicit to it, assuming that production methods are still kind of, to some extent, standardized. And, and labor power is a, is a use value, and it's a very important use value. And so any planned economy will need to think in terms of uh, labor content and the amount of labor power that you need to have you know, put wherever you need it. Just as, but but you're, but but it, the warning I think here is not so much that, it's that you have to think about everything else too. You have to think about the number of houses. You have to think about the amount of oil. You have to think about the amount of energy. You have to think about the number of trees. You have to think about more, more things in terms of. You have to think. You have to have a plurality of the use values that you're discussing and thinking about. I think that a lot of like, I think there's a lot of Marxists, and maybe I'm wrong, that. Um, are kind of against any kind of advanced planning because they think that it will just kind of simulate the value form because and they say that because that any kind of central planning would need to start to think about things in terms of labor content but i think what they're missing is twofold i think one that they're missing that the issue is not thinking about things in terms of of numbers and, and collapsing things down to numbers and abstracting that way the issue is doing it with just one thing the issue is only seeing, only thinking about one kind of value, that is to say, labor content. Uh, and, and then the other thing that they're missing is, I think, the uh, importance of the ability to hoard value. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what to replace the medium of exchange with. Uh, there's people that argue, you know, you should just kind of use this credit system that people have, that we have now, and just kind of uh, put like hours in people's account that they can bring to places and say that I have this much command over the social product. And it's not really an exchange at that point. You're basically just using that command and taking the thing. You can't really hoard it. You can't give it over to somebody else. If you can't give it over to somebody else, then you can't hoard it. That's the argument behind like labor credits or labor notes or whatever. Um, but my argument would be like, why even stop there? I mean, do we really even need to uh, ration that way? 
like obviously you need to ration sometimes like when things are in short supply and and when things some things are more important than others but um you know if 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 the reason that you're doing that is to collect data and and to collect signals that you need in order to uh make sure that all the factories are producing what they need based on demand then you don't need to ration and give people like an amount of command over the social product in order to uh, uh, distribute. You can just kind of keep track of the of, of what com- what leaves the st- what leaves the store, what leaves the place, um, and then at that point, uh, I think that you have eliminated the value form, even if you're thinking in terms of labor content quite a bit, because people are no longer going to be fixating at that point on one thing. The issue is with our way of thinking, and the way of thinking, our way of thinking is a product of our mode of production. It is a product of our mode of organization. Our mode of organization is fixated on value, and that and 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 that has consequences as we've seen. Another group that tends to be against planning that I feel like I, I need to address while I'm here because uh, even though it has really no place in 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 this video, but like nonetheless, you can't ever talk about planning really without inducing fear in somebody of the planners themselves um, becoming disconnected from society. Uh, and through their kind of privileged position, uh, becoming despotic and unresponsive to the public. You know, I feel like I can't address planning and, 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 and speak in its favor and also not mention something about this. I think that this is um, a, a, a justified fear and, is, and the fact that it exists, I think, points out that a big failure of the socialist movement up until now has been a lack of consideration for how you democratize the decision making for an economy not just democratize it at the level of the workplace you know there's a lot of talk about giving workers at their particular workplace you know a say over you know what they're making and that's great but we also need to think about how to democratize the whole economy as you know this whole society that you know if if the last 300 or or or, or 6000 years of history have shown us anything it's that the, a system of democracy in which I elect representatives to go somewhere else and, and hopefully represent me is woefully inadequate as a modern system of democracy and becomes more and more inadequate as the mode of production develops and the forces of production develop. Um, we need to radically rethink uh, how democracy should work and, and what democracy even is. My personal opinion is that is that the course to dealing with, with all of these problems is to uh, imagine a planned economy not as a command economy, but rather as a, a, a cybernetic system that automatically reacts to people's wants, needs, and desires and adjusts itself according to uh, the general will of the population uh, organically. So, you know, some of these big conglomerates like Amazon and, and Walmart and such are already coordinating like their own little mini economies in terms of use values. They're not you know, they're plugged into the outside world and they are configured as like profit makers, but within their own internal dynamics, they are these little mini economies that are planned economies. They are planning, uh, they, they are coordinating large operations, large interconnected operations in terms of use values. And there's a lot of waste involved, but, but there's a lot also of success. Um, furthermore, this amazing uh, amassing of, of data that's happening in which everything I do is logged somewhere and being used to basically predict the things that I'm going to ask before I ask them on Google and predicting the things that I want before I even think to order them and having them sent, having them made and sent to a warehouse already based on, on predictions of what I'm going to want so that they can be delivered within a day, right? Like, I mean, some of these algorithms that are predicting and coordinating the economy automatically are amazing and they're already there. So we have the... We have the technology to implement a system that automatically does planning for us, that automatically reacts to people's wants, needs, and desires and thinks in terms of use values. Uh, what we need to imagine when we think about the people that are administering a system like this is not politicians or people with power or command or, or like a command economy. I think what we should have in our heads is a group of engineers that is monitoring a system that's already reacting to what people want, that's already reflecting a democratic will of some sort and adjusting itself accordingly and 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 that the engineers are merely people that monitor the system and 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 aggregate data and present that data to the population and sometimes present them with packages and, and potential courses to take overall that, that they can vote on and things like that in other words i sort of think about this problem as the problem of automating democracy 
how, how do we how do we just make this thing go on its own? An another uh, kind of takeaway that I would caution against here is 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 kind of maybe addressed at some of the some of not all of probably not even most of uh, the degrowth people. And, and before I say anything, I want to make it clear that yeah, some degrowth is absolutely necessary right now. Some downscaling is absolutely necessary. But nonetheless, accumulation shouldn't be a dirty word necessarily. Uh, the only reason that, you, you know, if you think that accumulation is a dirty word, then you're fixated on the value form. You know, accumulation of trees is not a bad thing. Accumulation of uh, water is not a bad thing. You know, it, it, accumulation doesn't necessarily need to be a dirty word. It it's only becomes a dirty word when you're completely fixated on the accumulation of just one thing. Because as we've seen, that fixation will create disproportionalities everywhere else. That said, I think there are, are, are uh, definitely implications here in terms of anything that you want to accumulate. Because if I fix any one thing to accumulate, I think what this model show me, shows me is that I'm going to necessarily get disproportionality issues uh, somewhere else. Who knows where, but somewhere. Uh, you can't, in other words, you can't accumulate without making a mess somewhere. You decide on something to accumulate, you decide to accumulate it, you're going to create disproportionality issues somewhere else. Uh, I think that that is kind of another takeaway from this. And so, and, and that's definitely something to keep in mind, I think, when we're thinking about how to deal with the climate crisis, because there will definitely be, need to be massive projects. And, and, and I think that that we should prepare for those massive projects to make some things worse in some ways. In other words, I think what this model is telling us is that you got to make a mess to clean a mess. So, you know, yes, we need to plan. Yes, we need to plan in terms of use values, but I think the kind of the game to play is that you need to fix a comprehensive list of the use values that you see as essential and accumulate those and maybe deaccumulate some others. And aside from that, just kind of accept the consequences as they come because they're going to be consequences. That's sort of how I see it. And so I think those are some important takeaways for anybody kind of imagining a better future. So there you have it. That's that's the that's the extended reproduction part. That's basically volume two. So at this point, it is finally time to return to volume one and think about labor itself. We still haven't really gotten to labor. What's going to happen to labor? Well, in the next video, we're going to start to think about what happens to labor uh, throughout all of the stuff that we've been talking about. And as we do that, uh, we're going to be continuing to go through the functions and th and uh, gizmos. Uh, on this thing. There's a lot more to see. Uh, in particular, we're going to start looking through this other functions of the f other functions related to the system tab. By the end of my series, I intend to have gone through and talked about all of these. So look forward to that. I think basically um, the idea and you know I, these things never end up going the way I think they will, but the idea is that this one, uh, this one, this one, and this one will be the next video, and then the rest of them will be on the transformation problem after that. Uh, but the big, the big thing that we need to turn to next is this guy right here, this d sub l function. This is the demand for labor. And so next time we will consider what is going to happen 